All right. Five, four, three, two, five, yeah. four, <laughs> three, <laughs> 16, <laughs> four. Who's going after him? Row, row, row your boat. <laughs> and... to the Watchtower Podcast, the new podcast brought to you um, on behalf of the Towercast Network, the new network from Tower Productions, uh, where we just sit around and talk about films we've made or films we love. And in this show's case, we're talking about show uh, films we love, you know. Um, so before we get into today's episode, I want to introduce um, the people that are in the room with me, in this Zoom room. Uh, we got John Eric Castro, my co-host. What's going on, fellas and fellets? I don't want to. I like fell. I don't think I've ever heard fellets. I like fellets. <laughs> yeah, yeah really people, the film well, engineer, cool. trying to get their film fixed. What's going on? <laughs> there's <laughs> there's the fellas, and then you know the the chicken fillets. Yeah, you, know? you gotta be correct. Fillets, also, so they're fillets. We got a pat in that. There you yes, go. Yes. <laughs> and right, to top it off, we got, got yeah. We also got Michael De La O in the house. Hey, Ooh. our our How's trusted producer. And we also have Christian Yokomoto Medina, kind of has become our co-host as well. Hey there. And last but not least, we have Mr. Austin Young, making sure we're sounding good and recording this show properly. Our producer, thank Mr. You, Austin you. Young. Hey, Yo. 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 And, and, and Austin, uh, I'm going to let the audience like hold Austin accountable. If you don't hear nope. Austin talking as much as he should be in this episode, then you guys need to comment on the posts upon hearing this. Cause, yes. Uh, we yes. need to get Austin talking a little more in this, this show, especially for Hopefully this because. Yeah, hopefully because he's the editor of these shows. Hopefully he actually puts himself in in here this time. Yeah, man. Sneak I know. Yeah, exactly. man. Either live or not live, man. Sneak your way in there. <laughs> um, I'm gonna have myself come out of the corner with my thumbs up. Just <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. That's more. more, that's more. There you go. Um, cool. All right. So we're 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 talking about um, a special uh, film today. We're talking about Christopher Nolan's 2014 epic sci-fi film uh interstellar film um, of the decade in my opinion so we're, my we're, opinion. If, if you're looking at this on youtube um i'm holding up my interstellar blu-ray copy which as i try to encourage everybody make sure to salvage and save physical media but yokomoto brought something to my attention today that we need to be promoting on the show also which yes. i totally love and i totally agree with and that's to save the theater going um experience <laughs> At least to remember what it was uh, going to the movie theaters. Oh, because, I, was about, yeah. I was gonna say that. Yeah. I mean, it's months. Uh, it's at, been at months. At this point, I don't know. I don't know when you guys are gonna be listening to this or <laughs> or seeing this in the future. Uh, maybe point, Murph. Like, maybe Murph months. from Interstellar will be oh, listening to this in the future. Wow. <laughs> Documentary there. <laughs> I hear uh, my first thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, Komoto's absolutely right. Uh, you know, we're all we're all theater goers, and we all love going to the cinema. and And it's been it's been crazy to say the least. Our generation has never experienced something like this, nothing, where cinema like closes. This. You know, uh, the, during the Great Depression, there there was a time where where movie theaters were closing and and weren't. Um, uh, you know, people were kind of experiencing this, and and to a bigger caliber, I think. Uh, because even film companies are being sold and just the cinema going experience was going away. And it, it kind of feels a little bit like that right now because everybody's going to video on demand or to streaming services. And boy, do we all miss the cinema. Um, yeah. Thankfully, um, I have a, a home cinema that that's holding me over, but it's not quite the same. It's uh, not quite are we all not good. rich? Close. <laughs> well, <laughs> well hey, <laughs> man, this is, this is very simple, yeah. easy. Like on a similar setup. note, you know, the, the positives, let's talk positives and negatives of uh, physical media. Because yeah. I, um, when we were doing this episode and we were preparing, I thought it'd be really cool because I, I don't own uh, Interstellar currently. And I thought, well, it'd be nice to just go and finally have it, you know, yeah. uh, the disc and everything. I couldn't find it. Um, no I didn't want to go to the store too, too much because of everything yeah. that's going on, but I couldn't find it. And uh, I had to take the uh, sucky option of renting it online. And mm. there's nothing worse than trying to get immersed in the film and really get into it. And then Matthew McConaughey just freezes crying. And you're like, well, now oh. now I, I understand your pain. And I just got to sit here with you. Oh, man. And now we're both I crying. Hear you, I hear you. you know just, what? Yeah. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to vent here a little bit, too, about that a lot. Because th to me, I don't know if it's just me or my internet. I don't think it is. Somebody's riding their bike around my house. Um, 
That's many. But I've I've been seeing uh obviously I've been obsessed with Hamilton for the past three weeks or whatever it's been. Oh yeah. And Disney Plus sucks, man. Like they, yeah. they freeze. <laughs> yeah, and they, and they, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not just me then, right? It freezes <laughs> no, and it pauses and it glitches and it kicks you out of the app and they, I don't know what the hell is going on with Disney Plus servers. But well, Disney maybe it's Plus get something it about your life, man. Go get out. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me to stop watching Hamilton. Yeah, it's the so. third time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm getting I'm getting a little obsessed. But yeah, Hamilton, get out and get the fresh so, air. Man. So much so that Austin and I were playing video games last night and I had the music blasting in my room and he's like, "Dude, I'm muting you. Like I can't take this anymore." <laughs> <laughs> on top of me singing right so uh so yeah uh, uh, i but yeah, but yeah i've been there the lot and i and i'm there a lot with disney plus for some reason i don't know why mm. but that's why i don't like streaming dude i i, I pop in the blue yeah, it, it was like you know and last it, minute yeah. like you know we're, we're just gonna have to stream it so we can enjoy the film but uh yeah, yeah no d- definitely keep buying films it's so much <laughs> better when you can just pop them in the like blu-ray player and just enjoy it and you can go behind the scene bonus features yeah but what about time you don't think it's gonna wear off in time no, so that's well. The hopefully not. Just hopefully just saying, not. just saying. Hopefully. Like so, you know, there are some discs that you know you watch way too many times, especially like with DVDs when you would like overwatch a DVD and then like it would get scratched and all that. But then you Blu-rays just get another one. You know that easily. That's the beauty of it. That was one of the features that Blu-rays kind of did. Like you that's can, nice. uh, unless you're like breaking it in half or something, Blu-rays hold up really well over. Oh, okay, over yeah, time. I've heard of that. That's true. You've to, you've told me that. That's yeah. True. Um. You know what's fun is uh, coding yeah, or something. A, a couple weeks ago, we hadn't like Austin, Eric Sanchez, and I shout out to Eric. Um, we haven't we hadn't hung out mm-hmm. in however many months, right? And then Eric's like, "Hey man, like I want to go to Fye, like it's it's open again, and I want to just like I've been he's been he's been obsessing with bu- buying Blu-rays um, online, and I'm like, yeah, you know what, dude, I've been meaning to kind of get out there and buy some Blu-rays. So we went we went to Fye to buy some Blu-rays, and and Austin was with us, and Austin's kind of just telling us like, yeah, like. I just stream, man. Like I just find the film online, and and I'm good, you know. Like I'm with you. I'm with you, Austin. And I know Castro, you're legally that camp too. But like me and and Eric are like we always joke around, and we're like when when society crashes and when the internet is no more, we will still be able to play our (laughs) Blu-rays, and I'll be fucking breaking into your house and stealing that. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, no, but yeah, just to to this point, keep buying Blu-rays and and keep going to the movie theaters once movie theaters are open. Um, so, don't let that so that's one way. Higher. That's one way to support the the film industry too. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Especially people, nowadays, people yeah, may yeah. not know this, but your movie tickets aren't going to the movie theaters. They're going to the studio. They're going exactly. to the, the production companies that put up the money. Um, uh, so make sure to support that too, because that's so. Just like uh, buying music o- online, uh, you're supporting the artists. It's the same thing with a film, you know. Um, you go to the movie theaters and that's how they it's also with home media that when you buy home media that goes towards the box office believe it or not <laughs> yeah yeah um so the box office numbers so uh yeah I, I i can't say it enough i know that's a very good point yokomoto and i miss the movie theaters man i miss going to alamo every week the way i used I miss to going to an imax ah an imax yeah yeah, yeah. going for the IMAX right IMAX. Are, like come under the seat going man, to Oh, no, screenings. Oh, he's got his mustache there or no? Uh, no, no, this is way <laughs> before this. this the first one. And so, here, so the thing is that here in this box, I have like all these tickets from like at least 10 years of uh, movie going experiences. It. I gotta ask, just you, you know, do you remember which one's the first one? Which one's the first uh, one you ever kept? You know what? I don't re- exactly remember it. I kind of get fuzzy, and mostly because I know the first ones I kept were from the Dollar Theater here. Okay. okay, and because that was like right around my house, so I, I would just go there. Oh, so uh, I was kind of looking for like wh- which were the oldest ones I got. Yeah, and one of the older ones I I found was from The Wolfman in oh. 20, 2010. Okay, it was fifty fifty yeah. with that one, man. <laughs> yeah, some people was, liked it. Yeah. I mean, it's I hate you how they color, the color, man. Like, like I, I'm more, the same but, way, oh. Yoko. Like I hold, I have all my ticket stubs. At least for the late last eight years, when Sandra and I started dating, and we keep, we've been like like saving them. But Nerds. I hate how the how the the ink like starts fading away, dude. I hate it. Uh, like over time, we just see them fade away, and I'm like, man, what? You know, sometimes you can't even see what the ticket is, which sucks. Yeah. Um, and I have a ticket here, which is a very special one for me. Uh, which one? Years ago, oh, uh, around I think it was actually yeah, 2010. Um, me and my friends uh, were able to make this like short film oh and which we actually like thought of hey you know what let's get a movie space 
we actually got it there at the movie at the dollar theater and we so it was like our big premiere nice hey there, this was the movie and this is the ticket that i dude that's that, awesome that man. i made for it nice and, and it was called tan solo una oportunidad tan solo una oportunidad Nice. Uh, I, I keep it here with the rest. Like if it wasn't like you know, hey. it was, it's our real movie for us at least. Love it, man. That's beautiful. We did a similar thing for a depth of field for our feature film and at Alamo Draft House, and and that was very special. Yeah, yeah. Look uh, at uh, Castro closing in on the eye. Um, yeah, it's a very. You're absolutely right, Yoko. Like you put up the money to put your your film in theaters, and you see it on the hard out screen, there. and it's a it's a whole other it's a whole other thing, and and we got to packed the theater out i think it was like uh 170 seats or something, something we like had that. a q and a afterwards man it was yeah, so it was interesting beautiful. to get the perspective right away of what they just saw man it's yeah, yeah. it's awesome. yeah what's in a life just hear the reactions from the people you know yeah 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 so movie theater goers please keep going to the movie theaters once all this craziness is over i'm hearing that amc is getting a loan to to keep things going when when we thought they were going to be closing down because of the of this pandemic and they're the biggest uh, theater chain right yeah, yeah, I think um I think they're actually also buying out um like definitively buying out like some subsidiary theater chains like Carmike and all that. Is uh, Alamo just, doing good? Uh yeah, they they closed heard that, some locations in yeah. Arizona from what I understand. Um but the people here in town are saying that that we're doing we're doing okay and then you know they also have an online um like on demand service oh, Alamo. Wow. So I think that's what's keeping them on their feet is just uh, people purchasing through through online. Yeah, hopefully um, that's the last one to go, man. I think that's yeah. the one that sets yeah, me Yeah, I agree. One, I agree oh, with you. One, I, yeah. I love that movie theater too much. And then and then what's worse is we're just we're about to have ours on the east side of town. It's it's almost <laughs> like ready to open. Like ask Austin, we passed by where 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 time. by where um on Pelicano, on Pelicano oh, on three seventy five. Yeah, 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 Pelicano on three seventy five. It's right there. The building's already built, man. Like it's already there. So so we're we're about to get ours on this side of town and then all this craziness happens and now we can't go. So come on, Trump, come up with a vaccine. Yeah. So, anyways, today we're talking about 2014. Um Chris Nolan's film Interstellar. Now, this was a this is a little bit out of my element. Uh, I love, this is just massive cinema, and I think Interstellar very, very cleverly tries um very cleverly tries to do something that something that Kubrick was trying to do in his time, you know? Look, I know that it doesn't have a guy named Tony screaming and shooting pistols <laughs> and an Italian guy, you know, getting mad at another. It's not a Scorsese, it's not film, a Scorsese film. No, but you know what? I it's think, I think uh, Chris Nolan is one of the one of the directors that, that Scorsese very much appreciates. I think I think yeah. his favorite film from from Nolan is Memento, if I'm not mistaken, like Scorsese talks about that relatively, relatively significantly, like just the, the, the filmmakers that are making a difference today. And he definitely him and, and Nolan have had conversations like they're on YouTube. You could YouTube this. But, um, you know, I'm not going to like Carlos. My bad, my bad. I'm no, not no, gonna, yeah. I was watching Interstellar again. Uh huh. Nolan has jumped up on list and passed Scorsese, man. Oh, no, baby. It just, he's <laughs> so oh, innovative, oh, man. That's so the thing oh, is that, uh, uh, well, like, you I'm know, so Austin, I like having Austin on this episode a little more in depth because he's Austin's favorite director of all time. That's and true, like, Austin. You know, I'm with you, man. Like, after seeing this movie, just like the famous Austin Young says, what have you done for me now? Yeah. And Nolan has been producing, man. Well, you know what? That's that's what's cool about Nolan in this film, man. I think I I I feel you, Castro. And usually, when a film, I I usually have these these three words that I say once I finish seeing a movie. Let if it have. made if it made any in in, any impact on me, is like uh, in this case, I said Nolan, you brilliant bastard. Um, and I and I tend to say that on like you know Bong Joon Ho's Parasite or you know something that's made a an impact on me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For and sure. I'm like Nolan, you brilliant bastard. Like I had seen this film before, obviously, and I hadn't seen it in a while. Um, and I just rewatched it and appreciated it for what it was. And um, I, I before we jumped on this podcast, I told these guys like, hey man, I'm gonna need your help because I'm not smart enough for this film. <laughs> this film is <laughs> just it's it's got it's it's got not only the science enveloped in every single fiber of this movie but the storytelling is is just f uh, magnificent i mean well that was, a, that was the beauty of it right i don't know if kubrick had an inside view but this guy um nolan he hired uh kip he hired kip kip, thorn yeah kip thorn to to really infuse and it was more more than chris it was his brother um oh, which was yeah. the, the, the co-writer 
um, Jonathan Nolan. Jonathan Nolan was the main writer for this film. And I was actually watching the behind the scenes before we jumped on. And, and oh, Jonathan okay. Nolan talks about how they, by the way, Nolan, Christopher Nolan was not involved in this project until very late on. Uh, this was a project. Also, uh, that, wasn't this a movie that was going to be like done by someone else? At, at a point? Yeah. I think they were just kind of looking at somebody else at the moment. It was set up at Paramount. And you know what, what intrigues me? I know this is a stupid detail to look at, but I always look at it. When you see the side of the, of the Blu-rays, and I'm holding my Blu-ray up, you see the, the distribution companies. In this yeah. particular case, it's Paramount and Warner Brothers simultaneously. So Paramount got, um, got the distribution rights um, here in the States, uh, and, and Warner Brothers got the distribution rights um, you know, worldwide or, or in, internationally. So that's why both of them collaborated on this. But this film was set up at Paramount. And uh, Jonathan um, Nolan was writing this film. And, and he, Jonathan Nolan had been working on it for like nine years. Just kind of working on the script and trying to get the science enveloped into the film. Like that's why he was working with Kip. And, um, and then, you know, so what he says in the documentary is that, you know, I have, I have this thing where, you know, we, I, I run things through Chris just for that, that feedback. Any projects we're both working on, we run it by each other. And the more I kept running this project by him, I could see it in his face that he wants to get more involved. He just didn't want to say it. Yeah. And then once Paramount kind of greenlit and they were for sure going to make this movie, Chris Nolan himself called Paramount and was like, hey, I want to be I want to get involved. I want to be I want to do this film. So to what I need to do. And I mean, he's Chris Nolan. He, he had done it's got all of- the features. of Yeah, man, it's got all his best. So so sure enough, he signed on to do it. And, and here we are. And. Um, I, I, I could never say anything bad about Chris Nolan that, on, on, on any, any film I've seen of his. And, and again, not my style per se. I'm not a, I'm not a huge, big, grand sci-fi guy uh, per se. But, but a, a Nolan film is something I'm always going to watch, man. And, and quite frankly, Beautiful um, I love this film more than I, I love Inception. And, because I, and I love Leo, by the way. Leo is my favorite actor of all time. Ooh, dude, but, uh, very... I love this film more than I love Inception. And I have a really? feeling, I hope I'm wrong. Really? I have a feeling I'm still gonna love Interstellar more than Tenet. I just have a feeling. Dude, Tenet feeling. is because I, I, you still don't know I much about so Tenet. So, uh, here a, a little bit of what I what I go through is that yeah, uh, like with what are me you with guys the thoughts on on uh, Interstellar. So, first of all, this is the first time I actually watched uh, this movie. I missed it in theaters, and I just kind of like kept it on the back burner. Like I know I know I'll watch it eventually. Shame on you. Yeah, just how it is. <laughs> But eventually, I, so thanks because of the, uh, the podcast, I actually sat down and it, it was able to watch it. Oh, and because Redbox brought it back to their catalog. Oh, there you go. So so I rented it. I saw it. And I got to say, uh, first of all, there's some Nolanisms on all his movies. Yeah. Uh, where it kind of like separates me from fully loving the movie. Really? Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't have to lynch me, okay, Castro? Yeah, go for it, man. This, this is a perfection. This is per- this is what I consider perfection, and nothing's perfect. Perfectionism. Okay. So uh, the thing about uh Chris Chris Nolan movies is that usually they become way too uh, wordy, way too uh, a, a more exposition like, oh, not okay. not exactly. I can definitely see uh, that. It could be elaborate. A empty on his movies. I could definitely see uh, that in like Inception. Inception does have that characteristic Inception, a little uh, bit. All, all the the Batman trilogy also has that. Uh, Memento, my favorite movie of his, uh, is also is also like that. Now, but the thing about Nolan though is that he the way he directs, uh, he uses his techniques, even though simple in a way. Mm-hmm. But still, like attention grabbing in such in such way yeah. that it makes it more magnificent than what you know. That's that's actually, something I wanted to point out is that like the reason I say I'm not I'm just not smart enough for this film is like I get the science to a to a degree, but I think that's just that's the, the part. Of, yeah, that's just, just the, the part. parts, yeah. just the just the simple explanations. But I think that's what's beautiful about something like this is that Nolan tends to he tends to make um, people who aren't smart in these fields make them know like they're, I'm understanding this. Mm. And hey, I think that's okay. what Interstellar did too. It, no, I'll take, yeah, I'll take that. Now here's the thing with Interstellar. Now that I just finally, I always had that thing that Interstellar is going to be one of those movies. Yeah, a bit. Uh, excuse me for saying this, but a bit like 2001. 
Mm. Hey, hey, that's, that's definitely inspired by 2001. Yeah. 2001 yeah. was the basis to all of this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But now when, once I saw the movie, uh, it was different this time for me, for this Nolan film, because I actually felt more heart into the, the actual dialogue in I there. I agree. I uh, like actually like, this whole thing of a uh, theme of love going in there yes actually made made the film way better than i thought it would be yeah and actually made me feel something yeah i gotta tell you oh, that the the thing with the the ending man you when you start seeing this film and you start seeing these things that he's putting directly in your face at first it turned to me off like the watch the watch is like i'm gonna put the watch right in your face and i'm gonna tell you i'm gonna make you know that this prop is gonna be important for the end of the film <laughs> And I'm like, no, don't do that to me. Give me a subtlety. Don't give me, don't give me. And then you get, to, and then the film is so long. Also, it's like two and a, you know, two hours and forty yeah. minutes or whatever. It's perfect. It's two perfect. hours and fifty minutes or whatever it is. And it's and two. and then you get, you finally get to when Jessica Chastain's character, when Murphy, when she gets the watch off the shelf, and it's in Morse code. Then you're like, oh, that's right. You had already forgotten about the watch. Can you explain that a little bit? Because I, I kind of like. It's with the with the dirt, right? It's giving you a little Morse code with the dirt. So it's all about gravity. It's all about gravitational pull, and it's all about communication through gravity. That's the big thing that they mm-hmm. they can communicate through every, through different dimensions with gravity. Yeah. That's the big thing, right? So so what he's doing is he's tapping on the surface of this of this. Um, what does he call? It? He calls it a tesseract. I know because I'm a MCU fan, and they use the word tesseract in the film. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's the ball thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hello. Um, so Tesseract in this Tesseract in this thing, this build, this model that they built for him to be able to understand the concept of this fifth dimension. Um, he starts talking about at, like how he how he basically he's controlling it with his own mind. Basically, he's controlling how this thing works with his own things, with his own uh, perceptions. Right. So when he's doing Morse code on the on the edge of the bookshelf or on the or what we we see as the bookshelf, um, he's controlling the watch because he he has one too, right? So the Morse code is inside the needle of the watch, and that's how he's controlling it through this this uh, command center, basically of the of the fifth dimension. I think that's where. Uh, um, okay, I'm gonna change it from perfection to that's a little bit of a. <laughs> Yeah, because it's too, too, too yeah, too too small of a detail with too much. Yeah. You know, the the world is burning. Like, well, here's I, the thing. I get it. The I, chances I felt, are the I beauty the of the, the intensity, when, but when they were ex- when they gave the exposition, uh, exposition, and I'm sure they were just doing it for time's sake. When when uh, what's his name, Tars? When Tars uh, starts talking. By the way, Tars is so much like it's so. There has kid. to be something. <laughs> it's so. Uh, uh, um, I mean, it's so. You became my favorite spread. robot. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, he is. I agree with you. I like him more than like all the other AIs. I don't know what it is, but you know, that's from from hell. Two thousand, two uh, nine nine thousand. That's what it's called from Space Odyssey, man. It's directly from hell. Hell. Yeah, hell. Hell. yeah, yeah. But it's, it's like hell. But it's like how if how I had a sense of humor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what I love, for dude. Sure, like, for sure, it's cool that way. That don't way, you love like, the callback when he's like, "Oh, uh, let's bring it down to ninety percent on that humor setting." <laughs> oh no, yeah, yeah. He's like, he's like at seventy five percent. And then he's like, self-destructing in 10, 9. Let's bring that down to 65. <laughs> and he goes like, knock, knock. knock Want to make it 55? <laughs> yeah, dude. That's so good. So good. Yeah. But anyways, when Tars is describing this thing where he says, they have built this, this thing for you so that you can understand the concept of this. To me, that was a little like too easy. That was a little too like, ah, what? He, about yeah, it. he kind of did that like. Yeah, I don't know. It just felt. I, a little I will say that that is kind of weird. That that I don't know. Where like apparently they gave the information to him to explain to him because it was a critical <laughs> like, time. Uh, critical like, oh, yeah. moment in That's time. That's the whole point. The whole the whole crazy mind blowing aspect of this of this of this film is that what happened is that it's it's humans communicate. They are not out of space alien figure. They're humans that have evolved already past the fifth dimension. And those humans are the ones communicating with McConaughey and with beautiful. the daughter. It has so much 2001 in it. Yeah. It's so it's, beautiful. It's, it's insane. It's intense. Um, Delao, what were your thoughts on this film? Your initial thoughts on, on rewatching Interstellar? It, you know what? Um, I was coming back in from a cinematography perspective. And, sure. you know, I mean, from, from a story perspective, I really like the way they put it together. I mean, they there's a lot of concepts that are thrown in here that you think that for any other film, it might be a bit of a stretch. It may, might make it less believable. It might uh, take away that emotional intensity. But 
they really found a nice balance to try to keep everything together and, and to keep that emotional tie. And um, you know, they didn't use green screens. Yeah, that's crazy. That's, right? yeah. The, the, I mean, Nolan's just known yeah. for that kind he of did. like practical like uh, care in his film. Yeah. Which um, is why his budgets are always stupid true. expensive. <laughs> right. True, true. Uh, you know, I heard he, uh, he strapped the camera on the jet, no, for to get those like, like those side oh yeah, those, those, yeah. those winged, yeah, 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 yeah. What were you gonna say, though? My bad, my oh, bad. No, I was gonna say that um, there's a rumor going around, or I, I heard on a podcast. I think it was uh, the No Film School podcast where they said that uh, Christopher Nolan has a rule that nobody apparently can be sitting on his set like he wants to get rid of like all chairs and everything because he thinks i believe like, it man. I, I believe that it. he thinks that if somebody is sitting and they're not working then you know they are not like contributing to like his masterpiece i don't know but it just kind of goes i mean i, I don't definitely. know that he's that intense he is an intense guy have you ever seen interviews with him or you ever see how he talks about his films oh, he's, he's an so intense guy but I don't, I don't know that he's a prick i don't, I don't know nah, that no 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 like I don't know that he comes across to me that way, but I I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt it either. The law like he's he's so enveloped into every single aspect of his films that it wouldn't surprise me if that were true. So yeah. so I see. I mean, it just kind of shows like the amount of effort that he himself as a director wants yeah. to put into the film. So yeah. uh, I think a lot of his films just kind of reflect that. Um, and you know what's I, interesting? He uses on the cinematography standpoint. <clears throat> he he tends to use cinematographers that at least in the states aren't very well known. Yeah, I was actually uh, just looking up the cinematographer, which is, yeah. oh my God, how do you pronounce that? So Hoyt, Hoyt van Hoyt, Hoytema? Hoytema? Hoytema. 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 If we're butchering that, Hoytema. it's because we're American. I don't know <laughs> what else to say. Um, I'm not good with yeah. other languages. Well, what's interesting about it is, um, th see, this is one of the films that uh, makes people joke around about, like, cinematography even being, like, a category that people are awarded for. Like, in the, uh, in, like, the last Oscars when they were yeah. talking about, like, oh, the cinematographer, the guy yeah, who, like, yeah. you know, takes out the trash and does all that stuff. Um, <laughs> because one of the biggest notes I had about this film cinematography is how, how subtle it is and how... Um, where we were talking uh, last time mm. about La La Land, which I mean is just littered with lights and effects, and you can tell that it's just a camera guy's like a um, Dream. sandbox, you know? Yeah, yeah, because they're playing around with things. But then you think, for this film, you know, why would why would you want to add it's, it's distractions? Like, it's like, like the like editing. Colors. It's like the editing. Like you know, you have <laughs> good editing when, like Scorsese likes to say this. He's like. Whenever the editing is is good, it's editing you can't see. Yeah, and that's every editor's like like Bible, right? And that's every editor's creed. So I think that with cinematography, if you're so good at cinematography that you, people don't see it because you're so enveloped in the story, like it's not distracting. I think I think cinematography has the right to do yeah, that too. No, a lot of the lighting here, and I think it comes with the story. What happens is that when you have a story that's sci-fi, and you're going to be reaching a little bit with this idea of like people going through wormholes to look for yeah. civilizations it can get a little bit like uh jarring for people where then they think you know oh it's a, it's a sci-fi movie they kind of disregard the emotions the feelings the, the intensity the weight but, of, and by uh, the way the I, I feel like the cinematography captures something that's really interesting for me about the film in, in general Tell, i don't know if it was just <laughs> me but the effect that i got off this film is that it it hits a little closer to home right now because of yeah. what's going on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dust. yeah and, and, you know, using masks and the whole dust storms and the crops drying up and us having not having enough food. Um, that that not only I mean, the whole the whole Mother Nature stuff like that's been going on for years and people have been trying to fight for these um, these protections, so to speak, of yeah. our planet. Right. <clears throat> but just adding it to the time where we're at right now where people aren't leaving their house because things are crazy outside. Um, and us thinking like we just need a whole nother planet. man. Well, like it just hits close to home. And I think like especially in the farm the farm scenes the cinematography to me i felt so real <laughs> it felt well, so real for me that's what i was gonna say I, man the beauty I, thing, the beautiful thing about this film is the realism of it mm -hmm. i think this is the closest <clears throat> film that we've seen a black hole <clears throat> and nolan yeah. you know he hits it out the park it's yeah, just yeah. the visual is beautiful i think they won a um, the Academy Awards, right? It won a visual. No, I don't think it won. No, uh, it didn't win it. It was something else that won it that year. I Bullsh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was one of those. Uh, Did it win at least the score? Happened. It the won. Score it won best. It won best visual mm -hmm. effects. So that's the only thing it won. Okay. Um, okay. It did. It was it nominated for best original score, production design, sound okay, editing, and sound okay. mixing. 
The score too, man. You guys got to talk about. I, the I'm gonna score, get into that. Dude. I'm gonna yeah. get into the score because the score oh, yeah. is okay. I'll get into that. But um, um, Austin and and Castro, do you guys have anything like upon seeing the film? You know, uh, Austin, if I'm not mistaken, this is your favorite Nolan film. Um, I could be wrong. Um, I think it's your favorite Nolan film. But what's what's what was your take on, on here, watching it? Here comes a thumbs up. <laughs> what did you think of the theme of love? Love is seen everywhere, from the daughter to a brand. You know, Anna Hathaway. I think no, so, I think that that's the that's the fiber that's holding the entire film together because really? there's no Especially, way that there's no way that somebody will will hold on to that belief unless you love somebody. Right. Like otherwise, you just forget and like ah, my dad left me. I don't give a shit. I'm done. You kind of become the Casey Affleck character. By the way, I had forgotten that Casey Affleck was in this film. Yeah, the brother. I had forgotten that Timotez Shalom oh, was the in brother? this film. <laughs> yeah, yes, I had forgotten true. about all these characters. He's kind of like the bad guy, but he's kind of like the... He's kind of like the jerk. Like, the rational like, guy, I guess. The rational guy. Oh, Casey guy. Affleck? Yeah, Casey. Um, and Timotez character, man. Like, just the young the young uh, son. But, yeah. um, but I think that's what it is, Castro. I think for me, the, the theme of love holds the the entire film together because otherwise murphy's character you know she she would when, when you when you're in your the daughter 30s, man the daughter is beautiful like oh my god yeah. her acting man for such a young age yeah it, you know it, it messes with matthew mcconaughey man yeah and yeah, matthew mcconaughey i think he had just had a daughter too so it was just oh, perfect okay. plan yeah, the, yeah. the scenes when uh matthew mcconaughey is like leaving and he's talking uh, to her and she's at the bed and and i mean they break you they break all, you. all the yeah. expressions that you know uh, that she gives off you know to really convey that pain and emotion it's just yeah. i mean you know like on an acting standpoint would you see that in like professional actors you know it, it's amazing you know it's like that they can create that emotion but for her being at such a young age having that kind of control over the way that she comes across it. It's, and it's beautiful. Matthew McConaughey, just, you could see him like, oh my God, and then he sits yeah, back right. down in the, in the bed with her and it's just, you really feel it, you feel it. Yeah, yeah, man. That's... What's interesting is like, I feel like Matthew McConaughey's character goes through, goes through, I, I could be, uh, and I should Google this before I even talk about it, but you know how when somebody, uh, uh, the stages of grief, when somebody dies, um, you go through uh, the, the stage, five, I think the it's five like stages. The, five, the five stages of grief, right? And yes. and it feels like Matthew McConaughey's character goes through this. Like mm. he initially kind of leaves, like, all right, everything's gonna be okay. I'll be back. I'll be back. And then he goes through the denial stages. He goes through the regret, regret stages. Yeah. He goes through everything. So I feel like when he's in this dimension and he's he's telling Merv, don't let him leave. Like, why'd you leave? Don't let him leave. That that's so important, like to, for his character arc. Um, because he's, he's already succeeded. He's still yeah. alive and he made it to the dimension, but yet he still just regrets leaving his daughter the way he did. Um, you know, I, I don't, I know you guys were all saying that the big tether for this film is the idea of love. And yeah. I, I want to argue that mm. the tether of this argue, film, sir. thank you. <laughs> um, we'll save that also for the tower crown, but, um, I want to argue <laughs> okay. that, the key of the film is the human experience and the human reaction to life itself. And, and because if you think about it, not every single uh, time there's an interaction between characters, will you see an underlying element of love? You'll see things like regret. You'll see things like pain. You'll see things like distrust. No, 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 you'll see but things I, like trust. But I think what they're trying to go back to is it always comes back to love. Well, here's the thing. The decision always comes back to love. I want to say that if you look at the all the interactions with the character and treat like a, like a, like a whole yeah love is the only one that's like verbally expressed which you know it it where it bears a certain amount of significance no yeah it's, it's almost true. like hiding in plain sight i think i know what yeah. you're saying the love yeah 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 because i mean what you do you mean, what mean? What? okay okay like in regardless of like you know the film you can't show love without you showing the absence of it and you can't show trust without showing the distrust you have to have a duality that comes with different emotions because that's what's going to sure. give weight right. and texture to your characters yep. i think this film if you look at each character they're all going through a very unique experience but yeah. it all summates to the human experience i don't want to say that love's littered throughout and that that's the barrier but i want to say that um dr grant the daughter of the the, the main uh professor the way. Yeah. yeah her human tie what made her human going out and that's the thing that she's going to then share to the rest of the universe in the future mm -hmm. was her compassion her love and here's the thing though yeah. i feel like i feel like it goes a little deeper than that because just kind of in connections with love or me maybe even infatuation 
she was obsessed with Mac, uh, um, with Matt Damon's character's um, mm. work and Meaning- just with him in general. She was like an, obsessed with him and and and. And when she finally got to meet him, it was almost like a crush meeting her, you know, like, yeah, like a, that, a, a girl meeting her crush. almost. That's like you know? her character. But I mean, you yeah. know, no, that just means love is so powerful that it's so destructive. Yeah, yeah that's a good it point. Gives, too. It gives you a. a, a yeah. A, I don't well, know what to say. Wait, that, that was my one big gripe with this film. And, and I know you guys are going to trash me for it. But my one of my big gripes for this film is that. I understand that McConaughey's character and Hathaway's character, I, they had a connection, but it wasn't necessarily love. It wasn't necessarily, um, you know, you know. Yeah, yeah it was just, yeah. Joy. It the was bigger, professional the, relationship. Yeah, exactly. But, I was just, yeah. But the bigger ending, the bigger ending here was Murph telling McConaughey's character, go to Brent. Brent made it. Like, she's in this world, and she's by herself, and she's setting up camp. She's setting up camp in her new world. And that was kind of the big picture, right? The big, like, go to Brent. To me, in my brain, in my brain, I understand the closure part of it. And that's what I love about the ending. In my brain, I'm not going to leave my daughter's side for somebody that I don't really care about. Uh, so, uh, no, no, but no, 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 no. You're missing the whole point. Say? She's already about it. She's on her deathbed. But yeah, I know. Oh, I yeah, know. That as well. Didn't she say that? as well. She, she says, no parents uh, should uh, have parents to should like... watch. Yes, but that's so simple. Wait, I don't no, care. No. You're gonna tell me that a parent. You're gonna tell me that your parents, your dad, your mom. If yeah. you tell them that, they're gonna walk away. No, they're gonna Definitely. stay by your side. Yeah. No, they, they're they're probably the, the one who though. put me on the deathbed. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna <laughs> stay by you your here. side. A parent nah, will stay man. by your side. I think my mom would be like, "Yo, go, man, go, you, 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 go." <laughs> well, no. What do you mean, go? <laughs> go. <laughs> Because she'd be like, no, yo, no, get out of here. Why, why are you going to be wasting your time here where I'm just rotting? Like, you already no, came to solve it. It's the other way around. It's the other but way I, I around. Yeah, 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 my mom would tell me. My mom would tell me, give me some cuddle. cigarettes, get the fuck out of here. It's the other way around, Castro. It's you. If you were on the deathbed, not your mom. I tell my sons too. Like, hey, I made it. I'm it's not your son. It's not your son. It's your dad. It's if you were on the deathbed and your mom was the one alive and young and, you know. But there's something to be said that, you know, here's the thing, no, go ahead, go ahead, ahead. oh, no, I was going to say there's something to be said about the fact that, you know, when he left, the the thing is, is that, yeah, okay, fine, I'm going to destroy my old uh, comment about the emotions and all that, but uh, going back to the whole love thing, um, what he was in love with and what hurt him the most, especially you see it on the ship, was the idea that the people he was going back to, the people he cared about, and the notions he had, we're all just memories now. It wasn't yeah. memories for uh, Murph. It was oh, memories for himself. That's, because well, I now think, I think that's what's interesting about his arc too. Is that is that McConaughey's arc in the beginning? It's wow, almost like, like that, that. It's almost like that broken character that that he didn't get to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish because of his surroundings. And McConaughey's character, though he loved, you know, he, he had to farm and he had to do all that. He loved his family and he loved his daughter and he loved taking care of that. And uh, and. And that though, though those are sentiments that make him likable. Um, mm-hmm. Very deep down, McConaughey's character just like regrets that he was never the scientist that you know the or the on the pilot. start of the film for sure. But he's yeah. just the guy that never got to accomplish that feat. That's why he um, doesn't want his daughter just to become another farmer. Yeah, I'd argue that to a certain degree, his character cared so much about moving the 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 human race forward that he cared. It's like that scientist that obsesses over his science. More than obsessing over his family. Yeah, you know, and he gave I, a fuck about his his uh, actual boy kid. I know. <laughs> he just never he really asked didn't have all. a connection I with mean, that. Fuck his kid or fuck his son, right? I mean, <laughs> hey, you know. but that's that comes to you know father no, and son no, no, kind no, of relation. No. It's, it's tough said, love, uh, I guess. You know, he's like, uh, what do you want me to do with your truck? You mean your truck? That was that's all he had to say. Oh like, my god! <laughs> no, by the way, that's a dad's way <laughs> yeah, of saying I, yeah. I like you. You know what? Yeah. Watching the videos, you know, that's that's where it breaks you the most. Oh right? yeah, that, well, that's, oh, and, and I felt the that's, first. Yeah. That's yeah. where I felt really? like it was his memory. You know, it was just that wasn't who can he you was really coming blame, back to. Can you really can blame the son? Can you really blame the son for being bitter? Yeah. Can uh, yeah, because he, 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 he yeah he was burdened with all the you went through all the shit man no yeah, yeah. plus you're not receiving any messages and... back yeah no. it's just it's just heavy but but no yeah the law that's a really good point you get to see that's that's McConaughey's like the memories that are fleeting 
Yeah, um, just memories now, and I I get that that side yeah. of it for sure. Because basically, um, that's what was driving him, but that wasn't what was there anymore. And his well, idea if you notice, that you know, he's always oh, calling oh, out how many. He hurts. knows exactly right off the top of his head how many years he's losing, depending on what maneuvers they have to make for the mission. Right, like oh, yeah. we're losing fifty-one years here. We're losing twenty years here. We're losing it. He knew off the top of his head because he knew what he was leaving behind. And I like that after after uh, you know the whole thing with with Matt Damon's character on the ice planet, on the unlivable planet, uh, which was what such an twist. impactful scene. And yeah, such, what a such, twist. Such, uh, and we'll get back to that scene. I, I just want to talk about how, Matt Damon? Yeah. Um, I just want to talk about how, like, how when they're going to go around Gar- Gargantua and they're going to try to kind of slingshot their way back home, um, how he tells Hathaway's character, how he tells Dr. Brandt, like, you know what? There's no way in hell we're going to make it back to Earth anyways. We're just going to have to slingshot to the new planet. And... Um, like at that point, he's like, you know what? Let's just explore science at this point. Like, we're, my daughter's gone, my kids are gone. We're not gonna make it. Let's just go explore science and see what we get. Um, I, I think, think we would all get to that point. Yeah, I think that's a big cap. I think that's yeah. a big cap for his character. Is like, you know what? what? No, no, a cap being like a closure, like a a big a big uh, moment in his arc. I, I don't mean. Oh, I thought you were like, saying like. Uh, 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 oh, okay. I don't okay, see. Okay. I don't see much as a closure, but that's him being a more of his, realistic. Him well, understanding that the mission is greater than what he has to than what yeah. his, him going I, to his daughter is. Right, right, right. I, I think, but up, here's uh, the thing that like that's that's him his final acceptance. That's his final science, acceptance. That's his yeah. scientific acceptance. I don't know that it's scientific. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to argue yeah, that it's more humanistic. He's, he, it's more he humanistic. He said that he, he's already counting the 50, 20 years. Yeah, but think about it. Think about he it. It's more humanistic. It's more of a human emotion that he's going through. To me, that's how I feel it. It's oh, what do you mean? Did I hear, did it's, I hear it's, human emotion? More? It's his heart talking <laughs> more. It's his heart talking more than his his head is, because at this point he's got nothing left. Right. All he has left is science. Right. And that's that's where his heart is at now is to try to finish the mission. But he doesn't get to that point until his, the clock runs down for, for mm-hmm. what's left at Earth. Beautiful. So to me, that's more of the heart speaking than the head, the scientific head speaking. To me, that's more of an emotional arc that he's going through than, than I, a physical arc. Yeah. Um, I want to throw, throw something in okay. there. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. I want to throw something in there. Oh, I'm we sorry. We both agree Yokomoto. that Guy Ritchie is the best director. I guess we can nice. <laughs> agree to that. Okay. Yokomoto. Uh, I was just gonna go uh, veer off a little bit, but uh, go ahead and you finish your point. I'll no, my... you've been doing this too many damn times. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm sorry. inside what the mind of Yokomoto. Okay, so I was just gonna go like a, on a whole different tangent. Go for it, go for like, it, man. Uh, Get it left so for all of you that uh, might not know, uh, I'm I'm an ex- uh, expecting father. Oh, that's right. That's a a right. little baby girl. So one one of the things I always wa- uh, wanted to be for her life that I wish that uh, at least I have the opportunity to show her right. is for her to uh... is this movie <laughs> <laughs> actually yeah and like I wouldn't know. So, but the thing is that in this movie it actually encapsulated one thing that I wa- that I wish to show to my daughter my okay. future daughter right yeah yeah is the moment when uh, when Murph. Uh, talks about the ghost about the ghost and oh yeah the ghost in my room and all that stuff but right. he's not afraid of it but it's still he still mentions it um so matthew mcconaughey uh comes in and says like uh, well obviously he doesn't believe that oh uh, yeah a ghost come on but the thing is that he mentions he doesn't just blow her off right away he just mentions uh tries to teach her of how to uh think methodically as in oh yeah yeah, yeah. okay you say it's a ghost okay First, you need to get proof. You need to see how, yeah, how yeah, much yeah. evidence there is there. So all That's these true. steps before you actually say, okay, you know what? You you believe that there's something? Okay, let's see what is your evidence to support that something. And that is something that uh, once I saw this in the movie, I'm like, that, that's what I always, that's what I really wanted uh, that's a good to, lesson. My, to my daughter. You know? Yeah, man. For the sure. ability to think and the like to grow, to, yeah, to break that. things down. Yeah, well, you yeah. know, to, that, to, that to be really, curious, too, which a lot of people curious. don't yeah. reach to that level to like they're fifteen. It's, it's, it's short sighted. No, it, it's a short sighted way to think. To think like it's just a ghost because pe- people told me that ghost exists. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. You know, where whereas if you get curious about life, you get to explore life, and you get curious and you ask questions. Like that's something my dad always taught me was ask questions. Like no matter what you do in life, ask questions. Go through your like asking questions that's the beauty about kids man kids just ask yeah. as we grow older we get scared of asking kids just ask yeah. 
that's yeah. you know yeah no and it goes back to like uh uh christian what you were saying goes back to carlos in the sense that you know you see mcconaughey's passion for science and yeah. passion and like at his core you know you could think even before kids and all that kind of stuff yeah. that's that's who he was it was a man of science it was a man of research well, exploration, what, that's what I pioneers that's and what i, I think that's you know like once he's broken down and he feels like, yes, I've lost my family and I've had to give that sacrifice away. For well, science. now I'm back to where, who am I? And he's a man yeah. of exploration and science. And, you know, you hear it. And uh, when he's griping to his, um, his wife's father, father-in-law, yeah, um, his, father-in-law. his father-in-law about how we used to be explorers and pioneers. And we used to think about going out and now we're just here taking care of other people. And it's almost and, like... And his father-in-law, what, what's interesting, the, the line that, that caught me the most out of that character is, this world was never enough for you, was it? Mm-hmm. And and I love that line. And I love yeah. that moment. And and just it tells you so much that you need to know about McConaughey's character without this long exposition. And and I that's why where I agree with you, Delao, where, where it's not... It, there's not a ton of exposition. There, there's little lines that tell you a whole story. And that's so hard to do. It's so hard to do for a screenwriter to do that. Um, and um, I just think it's impressive how, how we learn a lot about McConaughey. Because we don't see McConaughey in a white, in a white you know, doctor's coat and glasses. Yeah. You know, we never see him in that in He's that the regard. Indiana Jones. He's the yeah, guy he's, who exactly. he kicks ass there. and yeah. then goes and out. I love that. I just love that about McConaughey's character where it's not this typical um, – you know those typical scientists that we may yeah. be used to the 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 rhetoric of that, and, and I just I just love that. I just love that's that. That's true. I never saw it like that. That's true. You um, know, something uh, I wanted to bring in, and it's kind of a it's kind of a curveball, but I'm gonna try to break it down so that way it uh, maybe gives justice to what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, you might have noticed I have these colors if you're watching the <laughs> the YouTube portion, and uh, you're noticing blue and you're noticing a yellow, and it, it's odd because you know. Um, Watching this film, uh, we talked a little bit how it's very natural. You know, everything is very motivated as far as the lighting goes. You know, there's lights from the windows and that shines on their face. And that's, that's right. what creates that effect. What he sees in the black hole. What he sees in the black hole, the first thing he sees are the, the sprinkles of light. Exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, um, for one, uh, for people who are thinking about film or trying to think about, like, how much does the cinematography actually play into telling the story um if you look at a lot of times when they're in the home uh you'll notice that all the light that's very um motivated coming from the windows and all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. in that it tells a story of their current situation the current uh them trying to conserve electricity because Mm -hmm. the planet's kind uh kind of dwindling out and all that Um, the chasing of the drone the chasing of the drone and and kind of the the lighting flares that we see um, well, when they're looking up at the sky, but it's also kind of muddled and it's also kind of it, cloudy. And That's what I was going to get into. Uh, if yeah. you look at the early portions of the lighting of the environment, you know, uh, when you're seeing uh, McConaughey and the family and it's before they find uh, NASA and all that. Yeah. It's either this very dark blue that's kind of showing like an end of the day or, you know, kind of like a bleakness and attitude. It's just very, yeah. it's very low. It's very depressed because oh, wow. it's like they're trying very hard to find a joy in, in, in this world that's obviously giving, you know, uh, difficulties. Like they say, okra just went out and that's the last yeah. time we'll ever see it. And then they're like, well, I guess we should just keep planting corn. And then the yellow, it, it's, it's interesting. You got to really hunt for it and you got to really uh, keep your eye out for it. But it's a very, very specific yellow. It's kind of similar to like the yellow I have here. It, it if you notice... Kind of- it's very cloudy, right? You would think that the light that would be coming through uh, clouds would be very white, very pure, very clean. But what yeah. happens is that because of the dust and everything, it's more it orangey. makes it very, it makes it very muddy, kind of, kind of dirty. Everything yeah. that, um, even when they're going through like that uh, sandstorm, like all the light that comes through the windows, they're so covered oh. in dirt that it becomes this dark, very tainted yellow. And I mean. Yeah. There, you could think of it as again going back to it being just a um, motivated lighting in the sense that it's trying to say, oh, well, that's the color of like sand going through. What I want to argue is that I think that that kind of has a rep- uh, representation, a, a metaphor, if you will, of kind of like the ideology and way of thinking, and how much that relates to like the current earth and human situation that if you think of like white light passing through something yeah it's been dirtied it's no longer pure the earth itself is just kind of like this faded 
um, tarnished, you know, environment. You know what? I, when, I, what I saw that more than all, more than in the yellows, I saw it in the greens, and and I saw it in the greens because of the of the cornfields that are planted. Yeah. Even those <laughs> greens are dark greens; they're muddled, like tainted greens. But when we see when we see him look out the window after you know coming to yeah. that, you know when he's 124 or whatever, and he sees the kids playing baseball, you're not on Earth anymore, you know, and the green is very vibrant. And the green is yeah. very new. You know, it's inside totally, the station. Yeah. Well, if you, if you think of like the yellows, also think of like the color of like the dead crops. You know, they give mm -hmm. kind of like a yellowish tint to them, the sand, yeah. all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, it's just this idea of it dying. Even when they go into the NASA lab, where mm -hmm. you see the shift in lighting that it goes from being kind of like blue or maybe tinted or dark and all that. It's very bright. It's very yeah. white. And I, I want to say that white is kind of like that glimmer of hope and or Ooh. truth that comes with the um, station, yeah yeah with the space station and nasa you know it's, it's very clean very that's pure. What it is. yeah but when I, um, again i'm gonna reiterate seeing the white inside the black hole once yeah. he sees that he sees hey i see something it, it's true it's truth that he's yeah. being uh you know exposed seeking. to yeah but um just going back a tiny bit because i'm gonna come with a, a kind of curve um it, it, even when you look at the crops inside of their like incubators, when re NASA's researching what's going on yeah. with the corn, the corn's covered in this like yellow light, which kind of just says it's 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 like everything else. It's going to die out. It's going to yeah. give way and all that kind of stuff. Um, we don't really see too much of these colors later on in the film. Uh, now the environments are a lot more white, uh, yeah. representing this kind of truth that everybody's being exposed to. Either a truth about the mission, a truth about themselves, a truth about the situation that they're in. The only other time you see yellow, a really strong sign you see yellow, and I think it's, I, I want to say it's a hint, but it might be reaching. Uh, when you see um, Dr. Grant's daughter on the new colony, and if you look at the tents and the color of the colony, it's this muddied, tainted yellow. And it's crazy. It, it's weird that that's the only other time you see it. I want to argue I think that that was a subtle cinematographer-esque way of arguing uh, or saying that the reason that he has to go back and find her is not only because of her, but because she's still stuck with the old mentality of Earth that's going to destroy that colony the same sure, way it destroyed sure. Earth. And the same... Until she revisits that bedroom and she thinks, wait, no. Until she is enlightened, yeah. she's stuck with the old mentality, the old way of doing things that, yeah, she's going to bring in a new colony but they don't have the tools necessary to sustain themselves to survive. That's why Earth looks completely different from the way it did beforehand. The the you know lights, the tones, the colors, all that. What's interesting about, you know, about watch it again, the, but, yeah. that point, the law is I was watching the behind the scenes and the, and on the bonus features of the Blu-ray, there's there's a documentary, like a an hour documentary called The Science of Interstellar. And they bring in obviously all the experts that were involved, especially Kip Thorne. Um before he I think he passed away like during the making or right after or something like mm -hmm. that. I've already passed um, away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and um, so when, when they were talking about him and they were talking about, there's another person uh, from NASA and, and her name escapes me. She was, she's like a specialist in finding livable planets for, for us. Like she, that's her, that's what her goal in life. Right. Right. And she was talking about how, when she was consulting for this film, um, a lot of the colors that they were talking about or a lot of the, the, the formations of the land. Um, she's like, I picture she's, she couldn't even tell you exactly like that. They found something. Um, she's like, I picture a rocky, a rocky planet surrounded with a lot of rock formations because when there's a rock, um, it means that it's, it's surrounding a body of water. It's surrounding something that, that would carry a body of water. Uh, that would encapsulate water and the number one thing that we found that that can sustain not just human life but any type of life it's liquid water right, right that's the number one thing life forms have in common that they need to survive liquid water and she talks about just the the gray rocky formations and the blue of the water and almost how blue is is to nasa at least it's it's more of a sign of hope than anything mm -hmm. um that color Right. Oh, and okay. and you know how like interstellar, yeah. even the cover itself, you know, it's a not, it's a desolate planet when you see nothing but white and snow and un unlivable conditions. But when you see Anne Hathaway's character, that final shot and you see the rocky formations and you see the blue in the distance and you see her camp to her camp to your point, the law has yellow. 
it's all yellow. The entire camp is lit by yellow Jesus. lights. Nice. And it's just that the combination of the blue and the yellow, and uh, it just to me was was perfect it, to, to your credit to what you're saying yeah. about yeah. the colors. It's that it's that, that glimmer of hope. Shot. Yeah. But then you can tell that there's something there. And I mean, yeah, it, it begs itself to kind of wonder. I think that's that's um, a wonderful uh, part of this film that it made you care enough about it that at the very end, even though it doesn't leave you satisfied as to what's going to happen to her, what's going to happen to him. Right. Because that's a, that's a whole nother journey. You're, that was enough you're just, for me. Yeah. yeah. That was enough for me. That was enough yeah. for me. And you know what? Uh, 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 going into the next thing that, that makes you feel this, we have to talk about Hans Zimmer's score. Oh, my God. We have to talk about, about Hans Zimmer's score. I was about to suggest that, yeah. And and uh, I want to kind of read drums, this this man. thing really quick. Never ending drums, dude. Just composer composer Hans Zimmer was instructed by Christopher Nolan to make a unique score. And his exact words, Nolan's words to 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 Zimmer were, "It's time to reinvent the endless string of sonatos need to go by the wayside. The big drums are probably in the bin." He said Nolan did not provide Zimmer a script or any plot details for writing the music for this film, and instead gave the composer one page of text. That had Whoa. more to do with Zimmer's story than the plot of the movie. So this was more about Hans Zimmer as a composer reaching into his own like life experiences than than composing to a film, you know. Um, and oh. I know this is a, 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 what's an interesting, interesting way, yeah, yeah, combination there, right? And and Hans Zimmer, I think, is very talented, man. He's 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 done he's done to his credit has done a, a very imp- impressive. Um, films like gladiator he did inception he's done all of nolan's films obviously um but he did uh he did a lot of the dc scores that get a bad rap because of the film sucking themselves yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, not but the scores are actually very very impressive the the man of steel score They're good by themselves yes man of steel is, is, is a very impressive score but anyways this score what, what i liked about it is that i think it's a, i didn't even know this before i started doing my research today but it, to me it just felt like it wasn't trying to impress you. It wasn't trying to, it was so subtle. And it's, and it's it, as a musician, you know, the chord progressions that are that I, I know the port, chord progressions that are happening in the, in this score. And they're not very complicated. They're, no. they're very simple tones and very simple chord progressions. The endless I, mystery of it. I like it. It's, endless. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. The score. I'm surprised. Oh, yeah. it didn't win. I'm surprised. It didn't yeah. Win. Uh, especially at the beginning, uh, the beginning is kind of like very subtle. The score on it i, I kind of noticed it but uh oh, yeah it was very toned down but especially but once they start going into space yeah. it, it does ramp up the intensity man that that like uh it made me feel even more just a majestic of space man and then with the, and the score coming in also kind of like flying it was like hey, well, one quick question was what was beautiful. the hand what was the hand oh, i was hand? himself apparently what do you mean? Yeah, it was Matthew McConaughey going through towards the end, right? Because he sees it, but what is he trying to do? First handshake. Well, he he just kind of like oh, look, he's reaching I, out to Brad's he's like, character. No, isn't he kind of like testing Dude. what what he's experiencing? I mean, that's I, I don't I don't think so. I, I think it's just because at that moment uh, he had already finished his thing with the watch thing, so it kind of like he was getting sucked out of the tesseract, right? And I guess during that he he just sees this fleeting moment. Of them going towards the planets and all that. Oh, stuff. okay. Like, yeah. Oh, hey, hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. Passing by. Yeah. So, I, I don't think so, it's like nothing special. It's just the fact that hey. I'm, I'm seeing. I'm seeing that 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 Mr. Hans Zimmer lost out to Alexander Desplat, which is somebody who I love, a composer I really do love. He Ooh. lost to the Grand Budapest Hotel. The score the of Grand the Grand Budapest, Budapest Hotel. It's good, but no. Ah, that's a toughie because I love that film. I really, it's my favorite. Okay, like, here's a good question. For Grand is Budapest. it just as important as it was to Interstellar? Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, what? it shapes the story. It shapes the story of, of the Grand gonna... Budapest. Yeah, it shapes and the entire Alexander tone. Alexander Desplat is a, the good, tone. is a good composer. Yeah, Alexander Desplat did Shape of Water, which is my favorite score of his. It's the Shape of and Water score. Say whatever you want about the true life, but the the score in that is really <laughs> damn good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Alexander just splats up there, man. But yeah, no, I I feel like you know what, uh, Castro, I'm gonna tell you this. I think I think this score deserved it more than Grand Budapest. I'll, I'll give you that. It's just it's so it's so necessary. <laughs> the <laughs> oh, Grand Budapest <laughs> is my favorite. Wes Anderson. I love Alexander. You know what? It's good. It's good. But but this score was so pivotal for the for the feeling of this film. Yes. Um, it's it's just so good. It's it's a classic score. I I feel. Oh, you know 2001 what? though. 
even, but look, even for Grand Budapest, I'm waiting for yeah, the telecom, man. It's got so many yeah. elements. Yeah. Right. For Grand Budapest Hotel, what stands out the most to me is the visuals and the color. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What's for this there? film, I'd argue that the score stands out more than the visuals for me. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's just more memorable. Both of them, both of them, man. It's just more this memorable. This is definitely a more memorable score. I'll yeah. give it that. I'll give it that. I, I Dude, just we have never seen. Th- sorry. Oh my bad. I'll, I'll just we have say never. That. Oh. <laughs> 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 okay. Let me both put my point across. We have <laughs> never seen such a realistic visual with no screen screen, just CGI. A wormhole, like. We've always thought of a warm phone. We've seen, you know, History Channel through the wormhole with uh, Tyson. I kind of feel like a lot of these images, Tyson especially the wormhole, I kind of feel like they just proved Kubrick right, you know? Yeah. Uh, like Kubrick's Pretty imagination good. was imagining this, and then we just see it scientifically. Like scientists were like, yeah, this is what it would look like, the people that weren't involved in this film. So I kind of just feel like I have seen it before, but not a Officially, like I yeah, have, yeah, especially sure. now that yeah. now that we actually have the official photo of the black hole, right? <laughs> yeah, it kind of has that like uh, very special like ring towards it. What? Well, yeah, I'm telling you, man, Nolan cool. hits every single point. But you know what, man? I think as far as I think as far as um, I always say that my, my favorite thing about Scorsese is that he never works with the cinematographer more than a couple of times. Oh, he never works go. with the composer more go, than a man. couple of times. But Christopher Nolan. And Hans Zimmer have a have a relationship that I hope never gets broken, man. Like uh, the, them two together are a match made in heaven. Like in terms of of director composer, um, I hope that doesn't go away. Yeah, that like, is true. I, I really do admire that 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 friendship, that relationship. Yeah, um, yeah. Do we have any last thoughts before we jump into the Tower Crown? Good film. Well, Good film. Well, a solid ten out of ten. So out of ten out of really solid. I, I, this is on my top five films for sure because it of all tackles time. it. Yeah, it tackles space exploration. Wow. It's got a story to it. I know you like Gravity, which we're gonna get into right now. <laughs> it just it had the same leap that two thousand one had and Star uh-huh. Wars had. It's just one of those. Whoa, mm. well, not Star Wars. It, Star Wars know, a little um, bit, but they're <laughs> all they're all from that. Yeah. You know? On a little on a little note. Uh, I remember when this film came out and after I watched it, I mean, I was obsessed for a while because it was just such, it was so unique in the way that it had the storytelling and the way that it described science with visual and everything. Um, I remember hearing that this was, um, this was a film that really exemplified the fact that now films were trying to do scientific research or at least have like, ask the right questions when developing the story. So then that way it would be accurate. And uh, mm-hmm. this, this film paid a lot of attention to being so accurate. It looks like having which gravity did it. It looks we'll like to that. your point, the little Kip Thorne made it made basically two conditions about getting involved in this film. And those two conditions were, um, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here were that the, the laws of science weren't broken when they were telling anything scientific. So whenever the film was exploring or even giving exposition on anything scientific, it can't make any claims that that aren't at least supported by science a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I heard uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson saying that the wave, he, he was interpreting it more as a tsunami. Mm-hmm. But he was taking it like, okay, I get what Nolan was trying to do. You know, yeah, it's going backwards. Mm-hmm. So you're getting the back end of the, of the tsunami, not the front end with all the water. Sure. Which is the little things, yeah, little things. That- oh, there was, yeah, that was, that was one of the things, right? And the other thing was that um, that if they do make any, if they do make any any theories that aren't supported by science, that they don't like, they don't make it a big point of, in the film. Like they don't they don't revolve around any any important plot to the film. So Christopher Nolan agreed because it didn't affect the story he was trying to tell. He's like, yeah, I don't care. Yeah. That's not going to get in the way of the story I'm trying to tell by all means, make all the facts accurate. I just uh, felt like that was so special as far as like yeah. making it feel real and all that. Sure. I mean, I, I know it's, it's absolutely it's, a, it's a, the dumb thing, but uh, I liked, <laughs> I don't know, this is going to sound dumb. I liked looking at the spaceships, which I don't oh, know yeah. what I said when I was, because yeah. Um, if you, if, yeah, well, if you look at the ships and the way that they were even they traveling weren't cinematically space, stunning, they were just real. Yeah, they, yeah, they were real. And the way that light, hits them and the way that you know it's super bright and people would think like well why is it so bright it's because there's no atmosphere or anything blocking like sunlight so as long as you're like near it that's a good point it's it's going to act um like the sun and then 
the sun itself is going to be a harsh light source. So that's why yeah. you're seeing all these sharp lines on the shadows. And whenever they rotate, all those uh, shadows kind of like overcasting on themselves. I, yeah. I just love the attention to that. It's something that a lot of people would think, you know, like they're, they're used to Star Wars and the way Star Wars looks. So this feels a little different, but that feeling was enough to put me more into that world, you know? And I think that's yeah. just something special about this film that it just I, takes that extra care. I like that you say that, Delon. And, and you know what? This film for me, um, usually when it comes to films like this, uh, something that's sci-fi, something that's kind of out of my wheelhouse, um, usually, here's the thing about Christopher Nolan. Christopher Nolan, back when I didn't know him well enough, back when I didn't know him as a storyteller, whenever I would see his films come out in theaters, I was always like, Nah, it's just one of those blockbuster sci-fi films. I'm not gonna watch it. Overrated. Hater, hater. And then, um, and then they came out, and then I saw them, you know, like Interstellar or Inception or whatever it is, Memento. And then it tell it really does show you that you can tell a story on a grand scale like that without losing artistic integrity and without losing the storytelling ability. Um, I mean, this film was a was made on a hundred and sixty five million dollar budget, and it went on it went on to make six, almost seven hundred million dollars. Um, you know, so so which which isn't a ton for something like this. I gotta tell you, it's not a it's not a it's not an outrageous uh, number. You would wish for something more, yeah. Yeah, it's not an outrageous number. I mean, the Marvel films themselves are you're talking about two hundred and twenty mil to start. You know, I'm uh, sorry, how much did Irishman? Yeah, get? but Marvel films aren't films. Though. The Irishman sir got like uh, I think the same amount, like one hundred and sixty mil. Okay, <laughs> yeah, uh, just, just want just want that information out there. Whatever. Um, so, so, anyways, but uh, I think that I can appreciate um, I can appreciate Chris Nolan as an important story storyteller who cares about cinema, um, and but cares about pushing the envelope a little bit about how stories yeah. are told, um, yeah. and, and that's important to cinema is, is to keep kind of pushing the envelope. Um, so that's kind of my final thought on on this film. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll just put in my final thought. Uh, yeah. So yeah, uh, Interstellar. If if you have a chance to watch it, watch it. If you haven't seen it. Uh, sadly, I, I missed out on the whole IMAX experience. Same. Because uh, this Same. movie had to be watched in, yeah. in a big ass format. Every Nolan film. Uh, Every Nolan film. Uh, this one for me the most, because especially because of the space thing. Like sure. Uh, Definitely. And the, and the sound design the is just so damn good. The yeah. sound design in this is really damn good. <laughs> um, and if you have a chance, uh, watch. Uh, I don't know if you follow the er, everything wrong with videos. <laughs> the CinemaSins? Cinema oh, I've yeah, seen a couple, yeah. That's the one for this video uh, for Interstellar. And they have Neil deGrasse Tyson. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. He says one. Yeah, yeah. A couple, a couple. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this one, um, they actually do like this whole thing of like people that are like uh, saying that, ah, oh, man, that, that thing of physics space, that, that must be wrong and stuff like that. Then Neil deGrasse Tyson comes in like, you know what? No, it was actually pretty cool. It was actually pretty true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This makes sense. You know, I can give him a little leeway <laughs> here. I saw that one. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's actually pretty interesting to watch that video. So in case of anything, watch that one. It's also pretty cool. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna, I'm yeah. gonna watch it right this after. This movie's way better. I got to brag a little bit. This movie's way better than I thought it was going to be. I got yeah, I, I to brag a little bit. Uh, I, I, when I went to Paramount Studios, uh, they, got, they let us go into their archive. And uh, I got to take a picture of the of the door of the spaceship, like the 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 <laughs> legendary kind of door of the with the circle and the, all the little uh, kind of spikes surrounding it. Um, yeah, they have that at Paramount. So if you ever get the chance to go to Paramount and go to the archive, um, they have it there. They have that prop there from Interstellar, and it's just so cool to see. Like, um, that's cool. It's it's pretty cool. It's, I have a picture of it in my phone somewhere, but uh, I'll I'll send it to Austin so he can throw it into the edit of, the, of this video. And. Uh, <laughs> On our next episode, we will find out another studio where Carlos has visited because now it's already <laughs> been two that he's been planting. Well, oh, he's got a couple. <laughs> like, oh yeah, uh, way, I've only been to, to those two. I've only been to Warner's and Paramount. <laughs> I've only been to Warner's and Paramount. So uh, you snuck on, you snuck into a couple of places. I might. Yeah, have. I know just, we're live. We're nowhere. Just like uh, Steven Spielberg, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Universal. That's what I had to do. I had to sneak into everything. <laughs> no, but yeah, it was. It's it's cool to see that. Like that. That's what I nerded out about the most when we went to Paramount. Was like. Where this is the interstellar door. Like I was geeking out so bad. Oh um, yeah, man. It was one of those things. But anyways, um, cool guys. I, I think I think we can get into the tower crown, Mr. Yokomoto. Yokomoto. So what's this week, right, Yokomoto? Guys. So the Tower Crown, just in case if uh, someone doesn't know. Me? Tower Crown is a debate is a debate show where the debaters don't always know exactly what they're gonna be debating for. 
So we put up a poll this last weekend uh, up on Facebook with four movies about the mysteries of space. And these were, uh, let me just give me one second right around here. Okay. So these were Arrival. Okay. Good Gravity. Film. Great film. 2001, A Space Odyssey. Woo, woo, woo. Great film. And, <laughs> and First Man. And Damien Chazelle's First Man. Yeah, that's a pretty good film. <laughs> So you all voted, and the movie that the two movies that came out were 2001: oh. Space Odyssey versus Gravity. Uh, why Gravity? Did he not why? receive my break? Why? why? What do you people mean voted, why and, Gravity? Hey, people people voted, people we're gonna have to be arguing for these right so now. We can't hear why Gravity. In gravity. Gravity does not have what 2001 has, man. What does 2001 have? What you were just talking right, about, Interstellar. Interstellar tries to uh, talk about a bright spectrum of things, and that's what 2001 okay. does, man. It starts from all the way from primitive time to beings that are just in the future. Okay, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to start the debate because it's already going. <laughs> what happened? Yeah, so let, let, let's go. Uh, keep on. <laughs> like said, I'm already. Gravity. Okay, so gravity. Arguments, who's on Team Gravity? I'm on Team Gravity. I'm I'm sorry. I just you know look. Like, I, I know how big of a deal 2001 is. Look, as 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 a filmmaker, you can't deny the greatness of that film. You can't deny the greatness of 2001. You can't deny the greatness of Stanley Kubrick in general. No, 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 no. I'm not saying you deny it. No, wait, wait, wait. Uh, wow, I'm wow. getting. I thought to my you didn't point. like it. I thought you didn't like it. Okay. I, I never said I didn't like the film. I just said well, t- it it to me it's, it's something cursed. upon watching for the first time yeah. after it being so overhyped in the cinematic society um, that you kind of get there and you're like, well. To me, the spectacle was fantastic. Uh, the spectacle was ahead of its time. The score was ahead of its time. The directing was ahead of its time. The, but the ending. Story, the story. The story was so big that I didn't see an intimate, an intimate story of 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 that I could relate to. You know, it didn't show me anything about myself. That, that it didn't I have like an Italian guy named Tony okay. with a gun. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, so I, uh, that's kind of how I feel about 2001. And, and uh, somebody, yeah, somebody told me recently that, that Spielberg f- felt the same way when he first saw 2001. Um, I've only seen it once. I need to keep rewatching it. I hear the more you watch it, the more it makes an impact on you. Just but, Nolan or but upon, talking about upon it. Upon watching Gravity for the first time, that film, what I think is unique about Gravity, Interstellar, 2001, is they all push the art. They all push the medium. They all push filmmaking to do stuff that hasn't been done before. And, story-wise? Uh, story-wise, especially story-wise. I think Gravity, I don't know. I, it might have been the cinematography, but yeah. it encapsulates it encapsulates an intimate story in this grand space setting. Mm-hmm. Um, I follow an intimate story. I, I'm, I'm connecting with Sandra Bullock's character. Um, I'm connecting with, with George Clooney's character, that is, until we lose him. Um but I, there's more of an intimate story for me to connect to than 2001. 2001, all it's doing for me is definitely making me think on, the, on an existential standpoint, but it's not making me wonder anything about myself, you know, to connect to it. That, that's kind of well, where it's, I'm it's at. In a, like you just said, it's a broader spectrum about mankind and its place in, in, in Earth or, or wherever its place is at. Uh, Gravity, that- okay, here we go. Gravity, why did it have to take off in space with her story? Why? Why didn't it? it's because it's contrast, Gastro. It's an intimate story placed in the vast grandness of the universe. It's contrast. Sure. But why? Why was it essential to be in space when the, she lost her daughter? I can and... tell you. Go for it. Like every time, I, I I'll say that I think a person goes through a traumatic experience or something devastating what are they looking happens for? to them. What are they looking they just for? Want, yes, they just I'll want to get there. away. No, they just want to get away. And I'm with the, you. I'm with the, you. The ultimate sense or feeling of like being able to get away is not just leaving the city or the state. It's leaving the planet. And I'm that's gonna, where I'm, you're I'm thinking, gonna wanna. I'm gonna that that's already she. she I'm was gonna, already in that when she lost. I'm gonna up the ante. The law. I'm gonna piggyback off your point because I absolutely agree with you. But more than that, when somebody dies close to you. You're looking out into into a, a supernatural figure. You're looking out for God. You're looking out for space. Something. You're looking out, you're looking for something that's out there that can explain why this person died. And and Sandra Bullock's ex, she's an explorer. She's a she's a she's a you know she's going out there to explore to figure out. But what my the point hell is that she, she was already all. doing that before she. Yeah, but I mean, the way that I was presenting is like that's how she got away. It's like no, she was already up there. 
no, no, but, uh, no, no, also no. obviously, but you know, regardless of like where she was headed and like the the practical elements of like the story, mm-hmm. you know, she herself is obviously going through this very human journey of 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 having love and loss, and then how are you interpreting it while going through this thing that you know you wouldn't consider quite human, you know, uh, a yeah. very like a space and exploration, and how even if you leave the atmosphere and even if you go to a different place um you're still attached to yourself and you're still attached to the raw you're still attached to earth that it's not that she had to leave because of her daughter um you know because of the loss of her daughter that's the way you present it no i know i know but that's how it's going to come across and i mean (laughs) but ultimately it's her leaving and having to realize that no matter what she does no matter where she goes she has to deal with herself before anything else, you know? Yeah. She can't, and, she can't, it's almost oh, like a superhero. Pause, it's almost pause. like a super, it's almost like a superhero existential question. A superhero always has to, has to fix their own drama before saving the world. And, real quick and pause. okay, well, space off. It wasn't about uh, saving the world. It was just, okay. About real, expo- okay. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm helping you out, Carlos, but I am going to jump on his train right now. So we'll just see how this goes, you know? Just, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, playing both sides. Uh, what, what else do you got? Uh, Faster for gravity. What's up? What else do you think about? Uh, oh, gravity. What else do you think about gravity? Yeah, gravity is good. It just has a lot of inconsistency, especially what one inconsist- that I think most mostly is the one most talked about is when uh, all the debris coming this way, or which is like stuck somewhere, and then it's moving. In space, it doesn't happen like that. Well, actually, there's I'm no gravity. Even if there's momentum. Mm-hmm. Even if there's no, there, momentum. There is gra- you're, no, if you see, if, if, if you see, like all the trash, yeah, up the there, debris, all the trash up, it's there. It's not moving. No, nah, dude, the debris, the debris is coming from the force. Did, did you not see the hole that was coming through the force of the spaceship? I mean, that that's where no, the no, force is coming saying. through. Well, well, like, big ass dude. explosion that happened. Yeah, dude. That, yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. In space, in space, it doesn't have it doesn't have the 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 throw. No, but here's the it, thing. There's like like when the uh, rockets leave earth right what they're trying to do is not trying to just get there and float there what happens is that they actually have to go to the speed that gravity would be pulling them down so what they're doing is that they're in a consistent fall but because they're going so fast that they're able to avoid coming straight down they're just orbiting the earth if you notice she's going in the same direction about scientists she's going in the same direction (laughs) as as the debris She's going in the same direction as a debris. That's kind of the whole point. That's kind of the 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 crazy technology that was invented just to depict that. Well, um, that's what the last scientists are. It's the only thing that they don't agree. Especially Tyson talks about that. Ah, I don't like Tyson. I think he's a, nah. he's a, he's a chicken nah, like TV Tyson. scientist. Everybody likes Tyson, man. He's a TV he's scientist. scientist. <laughs> like, what the fuck am I going to believe? That's like, that's like saying Dr. Phil's a real doctor. That's oh. <laughs> <laughs> what you need to do. That's a whole different thing. Thro- throwing shots. <laughs> I know, man. Dang. Nah, nah, man. Come back to Earth, Carlos. No, no, that's but no, that's no, way no, no, gravity, gravity for me was impactful, especially as a filmmaker. No, More yeah, for me, sure. Look, look. When you see when you see Kubrick, Kubrick's like this this Greek god that you can't ever reach, Fuck right? Yeah. Um, gravity, it, it's Alfonso Cuaron, who's a hero that, that yeah, I relate yeah. to. He's hell a yeah. Mexican hero where we I, come from. Yeah. For sure, for sure. You know, sure. he's a, he's a he's a Mexican who made it, and he's a Mexican who made it in Hollywood against all odds. And he's the, he's the first Mexican to win an Academy Award. I mean, see, it's, and that's and that's where I think you're getting, being a little no, not, not but you're being biased. Director, yeah. maybe, yeah. maybe. Mm-hmm. But I do feel like Cuaron is able to tell these intimate stories better than most filmmakers out there. Better um, than 2001. In 2001 was not an intimate story, Castro. It doesn't have it any intimacy story about to a guy. It. What do you mean? No, because well, we don't even okay. follow the guy. We, we, we forget about the guy halfway through. Shokomoto fixes. <laughs> no, no. Uh, especially actually, the let's, ending. Let's the ending is 2001. A... Okay, 2001. Uh, 2001 is the staple of all science fiction, man. Everybody's yeah. talked about it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, well, what else? Uh, what, about, what else about it? Oh, you have well, what I was just <laughs> what saying else about it. Exactly. What I was just, yeah, hold on. Well, what I was just saying through the whole time, it, it has the ma- the mass scope of what it's trying to talk about. Yeah, like, it's trying to tell you a timeline of when it when uh, apes were existed to you know beings that are from the near future. Yeah, it's an odyssey. Okay, Carlos. I'm, a, I'm not even going to ask myself at this point. I'm going to ask you guys. And so, then it, it also dives into you? mankind's. Huh? How did that affect you? What do you mean? How does that affect me? How did that it, seeing that film that way? How does it affect you internally? 
it answered a lot of questions that I've had. It gave me a bigger visual of what's happening out there. How but it's can... fiction. Yeah, Carlos, you want to get a fist to your face? Well, what do you mean it's fiction? Fiction yeah. now, probably. Fiction now, probably. You're telling yes. me that, that Sandra Bullock is going to be able to come down? No, but and you're, saying, fucking... you're saying, no, but your argument is it taught me a lot about science that I didn't know. It was all speculation. Dude, it all was... of it's come true. AI, we got Siri, we got Alexa. Come on. AI was before Hal was around. No, it wasn't. <laughs> yes, it was. Dude, this is 68. Where, where was, was it? Where was the it? First so AI that when they landed on the moon, so when they landed on the moon, they were talking to some some guy, some Siri I'm, person. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm, on, I'm, I'm on the team Castro for the moment. For I can't say anything. Got that, Alexa? No. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm just going to interject here. Uh, the, the idea of AI actually were told before it. Uh, for another example, that would be like the, how was it, the last man on Earth? Was also Metropolis. another one, which is Metropolis. Is Metropolis, nineteen twenties, Castro. Metropolis. So the day the earth stood still as well. The day the earth stood still. Was, yeah. Yeah. All this was it was. Dude, this is where Cubic got his inspiration. Uh, uh, okay, okay. 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 But 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 hear this. Hear this. <laughs> hear this. So with Sandra Bullock's story in Gravity, yeah. yes, right. it's a very personal, it's a very intimate story that you know a lot of people can connect to because. It's describing a human feeling, human loss. journey. It's, it's human loss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a very different beast to tackle when trying to create an odyssey where you're going through multiple times, multiple realms, where it's to cover the story, you have to go beyond the individual facet of a person. Exactly. And you have to think of the grand scale of the spectacle. Sure. And I think I, I want to say that 2001. Here's my thing, though. My argument with that is that you're absolutely right. You do have that's a different monster. I agree with yeah. you 100%. Here's the thing. I feel like Nolan had a better approach in Interstellar in telling a yeah. personal story while also telling the big the big picture. And he messed everything together. That's what makes Nolan better than Scorsese. Oh, my bad. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 sir. No, but that's I'm the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it, that it captured what... But what 2001 a- didn't do that. It just told the big story. It didn't, it didn't mesh it with an intimate story. It didn't. About mankind but, and its but you're, you're the ending. You tell me that you like you you, you like gravity's ending. I ending. wasn't a, I wasn't attached to that character. Who gives a shit? I don't care. It's not about the character. It's about man in its place. My point. There's no character. There's nobody I can. No, but follow. you're treating There's it nobody. like you're treating it that that's what makes a story or that's yeah, what I mean, makes a film and a person. This is going beyond that in a grander scale because yeah, you know, we could go with the hero's journey. We could get the individual, the person. Mm-hmm. And I mean the like super on the nose rebirth scene for Sandra Bullock's in gravity where she's like mm-hmm. in an embryo, like everybody it's on the nose. Come on. Right. But you know, if you look at this grand spectacle that I think, honestly, for what it's trying to do, for the emotion that's trying to be conveyed, the tension that comes with this awakening of consciousness going into the next evolutionary step for mankind right. and competing against that, AI, the dangers that come with that. And I guess the amount of questions and answers it gives you, but then also the amount of like, like, like gravity, the ending. after after you leave gravity you appreciate the film and you appreciate the emotional journey but yeah. after you leave 2001 space odyssey you want to think about your own relation and existence in the grander scale exactly everybody has their own opinion on the ending and to me the beautiful thing about kubrick is that back then we had our, well you guys know more about films but back then it was more of aliens looking like monsters invaders yeah whatever. yeah 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 i think kubrick i think that, that he definitely that approached was so that. superior that there's no point that to we don't understand visual. it yeah yeah, yeah. Don't, there's no point to of it and it's up to the, the audience to oh my god dude i guess what what happened with me is i was exposed to other kubrick before i was exposed to 2001 usually people start with 2001 yeah and i felt more of a connection to something like full metal jacket than i did to 2001 you know, yeah, different animal, but that kind of yeah. that kind of goes into uh, Kubrick as a director being able to tackle so, stories so of different genres. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I, I true, just, I true. feel that if you're trying to compare these two stories, you know, they they both tackle two different types of storytelling methods. One sure, goes through like sure, an odyssey absolutely. in a grand scale. The other one goes through a personal level. A little if bit you smaller. try to, if you try to, like, say, did um, you know, Gravity? Did you feel like you went through this? odyssey of mankind and like time and space and and question your existence facts that we're I guess out I'm of this so, world i'm so interested in how and how kubrick i guess again i went into watching 2001 with no expectations other than what people talk about other than the hype right yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. so 
I was I was curious as to how Kubrick was going to explore. Look, my favorite film of Kubrick's is A Clockwork Orange. That's my favorite Kubrick yes. film. You see, and and when when Kubrick is exploring A Clockwork Orange, uh, when it's, it's exploring uh, The Shining, when it's exploring Full Metal Jacket, it's exploring the inside of a human's mind. It, it just really exactly is, and going back to the law, what he said, you know, and and how and and since two thousand one explores, like you guys said, I, I I'm on board with you. You're right. It explores a bigger picture. Um, pushing the limit, I'm, not, like I'm not diminishing the storytelling aspect of it. I'm not saying it has to be a hero's journey. It's just I I was more curious as to how Kubrick before going into this film. I guess my expectation was how is Kubrick gonna dissect the human mind trying to ac accept all of this all of this new information. Mm -hmm. um, and and it wasn't about accepting. It was the journey. Yeah. It, Here's it was, the interesting. No, no, no. It, it is di about dissecting. Every film is about dissecting or exploring an idea. It, it always is. For sure. But, for sure. But uh, but I think that's my expectation of it. What's interesting, I'll give you this. I'll give you this. 2001 puts you in the seat. You're basically dissecting how you're accepting all this information. Okay, that's so beautiful. My expectation was the, the, the man we're following around for two and a half hours um, – and I'm, it's I'm not saying, about him. It's not about him. That's yeah. And I wanted it to be about. I wanted to explore how he's. Rep, he's a representation. Yeah. That's what you don't get. No, I get oh, it. No, no, yeah, yeah, I my bad. That's, that, yeah, that's not. I will it. say. I will I say that it. it 2001 does lead you on a bit because at the very beginning we're introduced to this idea that he has a family that he's not. Yeah, like what well, for, for an hour and, and, and a half? And, yeah, it's you're, about you're, this guy receiving phone calls from his wife. Like, what? I'm supposed to care about that? It's in the film for a reason. And then eventually it kind of goes to the wayside. Um, yeah, so, and then uh, after okay. 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 released in '68. Okay, come on. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> oh no, I'm I'm gonna say this. Uh, the interesting thing about this debate of gravity and 2001, at least you know from like in between perspective. <laughs> yeah. You're taking a film that you know is not going to be well received by everybody. You're taking a film that is not. Which going one? To which be, one? Gravity. Uh, 2001. Oh. oh okay. Oh. Well, no, because I'll say this. I'll say that Gravity put a lot of care into the modern, um, you know, the modern technological advances in sound, yeah. special effects and all that to for create sure. a story that even though it's just basically one character heavy breathing in your ear for like an hour and a half, you, you really care about her character. You feel the journey. You feel everything. And like you said, Carlos, you, you came out of the theater emotionally attached to what she was going through you and kind know? of with closure I and guess. It's, and, it's just and, something that like if you've seen any other I don't like closure. Things, like uh, my favorite Guadon pictures are more like his early stuff tu mama también, solo con tu pareja. but when you see films like children of men where it does the same yeah. thing you're in this big spectacle of a film and you care about what this guy is going through and you care about yeah. kind of all his life journey that's just something Guadon does so well is is make you intimately feel what this character is going through yeah um, see, and, and, that's I guess, and i that's... guess where i'm going with is that we see and i'm not saying that we see that a lot but the 2001 the first person perspective it was just yeah. not seen that's fair that's fair and that's ultimately fair and you know what like i have a feeling that if gravity didn't cast clooney and bullock we'd be talking about something else i i yeah. do feel yeah like if we had star if we didn't have stars in these roles that we'd be talking about something else yeah because i think but... that's how this film is received it's like oh <laughs> It's another one of those. Um, and I don't think it's that. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Though. I like it. I like no, no, it. it, no, it, it I like it. it. Just... I just feel like when you look at um, like 2001, honestly, if it wasn't for the fact that I'm trying to pursue filmmaking and I'm trying to pursue the the artistic medium of it all, yeah. mm -hmm. I don't think I'd appreciate it as much. I think I would have had like, I think for most people, if I show it to them, yeah, it's one of those films that's really hard to just say, hey, you're going to like this film. And then at the end, they're going to be like, what? Yeah, what, exactly. What Especially what, unless you're a hard yeah, like I was saying, it's, it Yeah, yeah. And, and you have an attention and deficit. I like, I, it's okay. I don't think she's listening. No, I if I, if I gave like, this to look, my girlfriend, thing, I gave this to my girlfriend. That. Okay. No, no. I, I mean, the only thing I was going to say was that I, I can't deny this. I mean, the film is three and a half hours long. Okay. Yeah. And nowadays, every single oh, frame, every, in terms of cinematography and not in terms of storytelling necessarily, in terms of cinematography and spectacle, I couldn't take my eyes off of it. The film is, is beautiful. It, it's a beautiful film. It's a beautifully constructed film. I couldn't take my eyes off of it. Every single frame is an interesting frame. And, but I it's, guess I, and, and it's shot in widescreen. That's, the, to shoot a sci-fi film in widescreen is it's 
it's, it's just beautiful. It's Let just... me ask you something. Do you think it was too slow? No. Nah, mm, mm. Or, or, yeah. or it didn't have. Or, or you feel like because I know Kubrick when 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 it first released it, he went back like he had the chance yeah, in the nigger career. No, no, he 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 deleted twenty minutes of it because he well, even thought. No, I think the studio wanted to, the studio cut it, and he or went something. back to kind of like re-release it. <laughs> oh, okay, um, okay. Yeah, but but no, I I don't. I mean, it, I'm used to though that length of film. Yeah, and I'm used but, uh, to. I'm I mean, because it's not your your style, I guess. It's not. It's got no Italian. It it's just because I can't. I can't say it bored me. It had me through the whole way through. It, it had me through. It didn't bore me. It wasn't a slow burn necessarily for me. That's good, man. However, people, yeah. however, I do feel like the entire time I was like, "Okay, what's next?" Like, I'm, a, I'm yeah. not, I'm not fulfilled yet. What's going on? Like, what's next? Well, what you I know, was trying to get to with the the two films. Not- oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go for it. Go for it. No, what this I'm guy, you think he's, he's looking at it the wrong way. My bad. My bad, little. <laughs> go for it. Go for it. <laughs> what I was trying to get to is yeah. that um if you look at both films you know there's there's a charm that i think comes with 2001 that you don't find with gravity because definitely of yeah. the, the 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 scale the spectacle i mean for the time it was revolutionary it's something that Ooh. a lot of people look back to as a standard for inspiration i sure. mean you know even it the is. ship in uh you know uh what's it called interstellar like i efficiency, mean it, all, efficiency efficiency yeah. efficiency 2001 but, like i've said this before i, I 2001 what impresses me the most about about this film is the fact that it had a smaller budget than star wars and looked a hundred yeah. times better yeah you know? i didn't know that it, it, it's it, just it, yeah it's it, just, it came out the same year it's a, the, <laughs> you know well star wars was 77 yeah, and it came out in this one 68 sorry but it came out before star wars and it had le- a less of a budget less technology than star wars had and it's a better film you know yeah. So, so that's, then, it's impressive. It's impressive. It, it kind of comes down to this idea of like, what is the purpose of film and what, what is it supposed to do at the very end? And if you say a film, a good film, the, the best film you could make yeah. is just solely meant to entertain people. Yeah. Then, oh, um, then why isn't like the Avengers winning Oscars? Right, but if you right. say that the best film is something that progresses, um, the way films are made and progresses maybe the way films are thought of like the way cinema is accepted and the way the art form itself is viewed as an entirety and what it adds to the art form you know then that's when you're giving it more to like other films that yeah they're not super popular by the masses but they have something that for people who respect the art form that's what what they go for what i think Mm -hmm. is interesting Mm -hmm. i i'm i just thought of this this just occurred to me but i think i think men in black may have ruined the ending of 2001 a space odyssey for me um and i know it's a weird comparison but you know how the in the ending of men in black you basically they you know extra terrestrials are playing marbles yeah and we're, we're one of those marbles like right. we're nothing compared to these big existential beings it makes you think that's yeah. what 2001 a space odyssey did right so i was makes exposed to men in, that's what uh, i was I exposed never to men had in, thought i, I was <laughs> exposed really to men thing. in black before i was ever exposed to 2001 yeah. so i guess in my mind i was like well I've already seen that, you know, like I've already seen this. Get out of here, like, man. There's bigger than us. The, yeah, the, I mean, it's pretty simplistic you know. way to look at it, but yeah, it's we're, got we're, more. It's okay. got more of a punch than that. <laughs> it's got a never okay, guys, uh, any, any I know it's coming. Before, Give it to me. No, yeah, yeah. In, 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 in Carlos's fairness, yes, uh, Space Odyssey has been, you know, it, it's the the pedestal, I guess. Gravity, it's a little newer. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'll give you, you know, I have the upper hand in this one, I guess. Come on, Grand Budapest. <laughs> we really will free. talk about Grand Budapest. Dude, I'm gonna be so surprised you. if I lose. <laughs> no, you're not gonna lose. Come on now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Any other thoughts? Anything? Uh, cool? I, 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 I'm I just telling you, up argue, here. I just want to argue that Nolan is the best. Clear, dude. I just want to make it better. clear. I just want to make it clear to our listeners that I'm not anti 2001: A Space Odyssey. I think it's a revolutionary yeah, film. Yeah, that's how you come in across, but um, okay, okay. I mean, I guess no, so. no. I mean, all right. <laughs> just, no, just just like just like every other episode, we always kind of like, all right, we argued about that, but my this is my point. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. Um, I think 2001 is is revolutionary. I uh, same thing of memor- like memorability. Like, I don't think Gravity is going to be remembered in 50 years, but yeah, 2001 is. Yeah. You know, so, I argue that. 
I'd argue why, 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 why? Because uh, it, they they did um, what is it called? I, I forgot exactly what happened, but basically they uh, experimented with the way the sounds projected in the theater. Yeah, to yeah. make it a more yeah. realistic experience. Yeah. that's something that when people talk about later on, they say, "Well, how did sound get to this point?" Gravity is going to be one of those fundamental films. That's true. That's true. Just it it like, is going to be remembered on the technical aspects of it. You're absolutely yeah, That's right. too much. He hasn't announced it yet. And I guess I think that helped no, you guys no, a little bit. No, but I think that the, the point of that too is that uh, I, I'm, I'm again, I'm going to brag again. I, I, I went to the Warner Brothers lot the first time I ever went. Um, you know, my fiance and I, they take you to, through this sound stage uh, through, I think it's called the Dolby sound stage. And the film that they show you to demonstrate how cinema is supposed to be uh, presented in the, in the theater is right. gravity and and so, how gravity on the on the 5.1 or 7.1 um theater presentation of cinema that's the right way to do it that's basically what they were trying to say um so with uh, the warner brothers lot if you ever go that's one of the first rooms they take you to and you get to experience the sound the way it's supposed to be experienced you know um so you're right about that the yeah, that's I, one I, of the key things for sure all yeah. right all right guys so uh final tally is in and the winner for this week's uh, Tower Crown will be... Gravity! Oh, what? What? <laughs> what? Wow. What's it? Okay, wow. Uh, okay, okay. Yo, like said, it was Yo, explain, yeah, explain yourself. Explain your reasoning. Yeah, I like that. I, Thumbs I like down. That. <laughs> Like that, of course you do. <laughs> no, no, I, I like, I like, like, like that. He was keeping tally of both of our points, so I'm. No, yeah, yeah, for sure. What, for sure. What, how? Yeah, I have my notes right here. Yeah, yo, come on, Did the last uh, point change it? <laughs> I know, man. <laughs> wow, it, it wasn't I'm that shocked. much of a game changer at the, those last points, but it was mostly on the fact that uh, it was uh, the way you guys argued uh, uh, gravity of it being way more personal and more connecting towards the audiences. And that was Dep- which way audiences? more hard hitting those points. Is? Yeah, huh? well, yeah, it d- d- depends on the audiences. I think you know, I mean, a yeah, part depends, of the but that's the thing. So, uh, at least like going more and more, okay, those yeah, points as you were stating, I feel yeah. um, it, it became more as uh, gravity was more significant emotionally than, than it was, and that was a bigger point than what was the excess existentialism. Of 2001. And let me let me argue this. Wait, wait, wait. I think it's important for me. It's important for me to admit this. It's important for me to admit this. I'm usually on that side of of the tally. Uh, Let me tell you why. My my fiance Sandra and I always get into this (laughs) argument. How every time we walk out of a movie, she says she's she's a general audience member. Her perspective is from a general audience member. I like. And my perspective is from a filmmaker, film lover, kind of. AC. Right. Okay. Yeah. Sure. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the whole episode. My bad. And, and, and we kind of get back into the, into this. Yeah, we get into like little arguments about every film we watch, right? And and I think that's what Yokomoto is kind of arguing. If you sit these two films next to each other, the general audience is going to connect more with Gravity than it is to yeah. 2001. Yeah, that's what. And like saying. Delao was arguing, only a filmmaker kind of film lover is going to pre. I mean, look, if, yeah, if, this you, is a, did, if you didn't though. know anything Did about a Kubrick or cinema. And you watch 2001: A Space Odyssey. I mean, yeah, come on. Th- what the law was saying for sure. They're just, it's, it's just it's one of those things where I think us. people it's that watch 2001. Standards. It's different yeah. standards. Yeah. I'll when somebody watches 2001: A Space Odyssey that I know, like they they say, you know what, man, it was too long, but I forced myself to sit through it. I forced nowadays, myself to sit through it. The attention deficit it, 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 it today. Back then, it was just like I know, but but I've what, never you're right. seen yeah, yeah, yeah. This. You're right, but my question, my question to that is, if you had to force yourself to sit through it just because it's Kubrick's classic film, hey, today, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 like, today like, it would like, be a little bit more modern, you know. Like more, Carlos more was saying, you know, there's other films that Kubrick's done that you're glued to the, the screen to the, and you're, you're 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 in it. You're I mean, what but this tackles, is about space. It's but, just the dude, central I think, definition I think of space. Metal jacket, trying to cover a whole spectrum. I think, of, I think Full Metal no, Jacket it, it, is better I think than Apocalypse Now. I think Full Metal Jacket is better than Apocalypse Now in terms of storytelling yeah. and in terms yeah, yeah. of being glued to the screen For and sure, being yeah. immersed in these characters. Vincent Donofario in Full Metal Jacket, like, I mean, so you know what I mean? Like, I uh, that's what 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 I think we're arguing is like, yeah. I for, be- for what 2001 uh, Space Odyssey accomplished, yeah. yeah, I don't think anybody else could have done. Inspiration. And we, we all agree that it's yeah, like yeah. one of those films that only Absolutely. only Kubrick, his direction, yep. and that that team that worked on it 
could have accomplished something that you know was that grand of a spectacle. Think about, think did he even have advisors? Did he even have like physicist advisors? Uh, he had his aunt. I don't think <laughs> that's even more impressive, man. <laughs> Crazy or not? Holy think about, shit! No, no. Think about, think about, uh, think about. By the way, look, I'm sorry. I'm not diminishing Kubrick. I'm not diminishing his work, but um, I mean, it was kind of his idea to release a novel with it. Um, so a lot of people's like reactions oh. are like, "What came first, the chicken or the, right. egg? the egg?" Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, Easy, like, the egg. Next question. <laughs> it became before the movie, right? If I'm yeah, correct. it was released before the film. Exactly. It was <laughs> the novel was released before the film. So, so I think look when it comes to Kubrick, um, think about Spielberg's AI. That was that was Kubrick's vision told yeah. through Spielberg's lens. Cool. And when you see AI, you get this 2001 feeling. Yeah. This this yeah, yeah. utopia of a world of like the future and and this crazy kind of feel, but 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 you connect to the characters in AI, you connect to that kid, you connect to that teddy bear, you For connect sure. to that. With, you know uh, what I'm saying? With, with a bunch of other movies too. This yeah. is different. It makes yeah. you open your eyes instead of oh, okay, I'm gonna get into this relationship right yeah. here that I'm seeing on screen. Like, yeah, no, it's, whoa, holy. It's, no, but but you it's have to fun. you have to be there for that. You have to be there yeah. to uh take the time to appreciate the film for what it is because you know it's not gonna give yeah, you any definitely. Help. And Absolutely. with gravity, Absolutely. with gravity, it's it's a great film, a, a like, good film that like was made for like you know the, the general audience that yeah. in and it of itself it advanced cinema to some degree that I think it yeah. will be remembered for. But if you go back and watch it, you'll be able to appreciate the film and you won't have to have it. It's, any it's of, like Interstellar, like, man. Like Interstellar is this big, big blockbuster that was marketed as this big film, but it has a good internal story to it. And I think that's oh, what gravity has for it. Yeah, yeah, that's what gravity yeah, has yeah, going for it. said that he picked a lot from Kubrick, man. And, and George Lucas too. So it's just, an, it's just what you see when, you know, when just, students. Yeah. What? It's hard. It's one of it's really the, hard. both of these movies. Both of these movies for me are those that if you if ever you see that it, it gets re released in theaters, give yourself a chance to watch them. Yeah, because both of them in the theaters. Yeah, are masters. Yeah, sure. Here's the thing, yeah. though. Here's Just the thing. Uh, to, to your point, Castro. To your point, you guys know me, and I've talked about it on this podcast. I'm so oh, ceremonial when it comes to watching films. Mm-hmm. That uh, that's why I'm happy. I have my my home little theater because. I'm able to experience films that way, especially for the first time. 2001 Damn, Space Odyssey. that's true. So, so he, let me put it to you this way. And this is probably going to end the debate. And I know Gravity already won. Gravity is something that I'll, I'd probably throw on, on my phone to watch at, at the waiting doctors of an office. But 2001 a space, a space Odyssey, I could never do that. Yeah, I'd have to watch old. it on my projector. It. I get it. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of that's a big difference to weigh in on, you know? Uh, yeah, I think that I, I have to watch 2001 on the projector. I can't, I you know, but Gravity, yeah, I could probably throw it on my phone or if I'm, you know, kind of watching something on the background. I, That's true. I mean, to, I know, I'm, yeah, I, I, I'm just, I, I'm just yeah, hoping and waiting so that long that you can pick, you can pick a, yeah. a boring spot. I guess I've yeah. never seen a dead horse so beat. <laughs> <laughs> like, However, Cuaron's Roma uh, is a whole other story. I have to see that on the projector. I can't. You know, you have to see it on big screens. There's films you just have to see on the big screen. Oh, you're gonna get mad at me. I haven't yeah, seen that one. Oh, children so, of Men. I know, I know. I'll argue that that children of Men. Children of Men. Yeah, okay. but no, the g- great argument, guys. I I thought 2001 for sure was gonna take it. Um, I'll be I, don't, I still don't know how. Oh, but okay, okay. <laughs> Again, okay. this is for the best argued movie. Not necessarily means it's the best one, but that's best fair. Oh no, yeah, 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 that's for true. sure. That's for absolutely sure. true. And that's the uh, Tower Crown. I love the that's arguments, the man, because it gives me a different perspective of things that I haven't seen that I didn't just yeah. didn't catch. Dude, beautiful, beautiful. Same. All right, do we have anything else for for any of these two films or for Interstellar, guys? Any final thoughts oh. before we sign off? Space uh, is a dangerous mistress. That's all. That's I, 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 I wish they made more space <laughs> movies like this. There's just okay. too many, too too few of them. Most of them are independent. I've seen like Europa. You need, you I need more I, I'd argue the, ones I, like I'd argue the opposite, Castro. I think there's too many buck blockbusters that tell shitty stories, and that's what ruins it for space films. Well, yeah, that's true. No, not for sure. But I mean, like, you got First Man, you got Moon, you got you know those are good ones. We need yeah, more of those. Kind of more mm-hmm. recent ones, yeah. Yeah, I'd argue I just I like, just the Netflix suck. Yeah, I've, I've seen some so shitty ones. I've been but, seeing some. But shitty the Martian ones. was awesome. I love the Martian. I love Ridley hey, Scott's The Martian. D- is, is there any way? Is there any way it's inter- interconnected with right, Interstellar? Right, because it's the same guy. And, and then they talk about dimensions. Yeah, and then he was left, and he was left, you know? I don't know. 
it, I just like, I just love the comedy aspect of The Martian. I think. Well, we're gonna talk about The Martian at a later time, but but there's uh, no not, there's no what you guys think where you guys could nah, kind of, potatoes. Uh, that's a stretch. Yeah. Why? Because it's just Jessica Chastain and it's Matt Damon. And then it, you know it's the, the different universes, different dimensions. He was stuck yeah. somewhere. He's somewhere. Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll see you later on with as that uh that meme from it's always sunny. Look, look, just yeah, look at this. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it connects. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, now, well, we want to thank everybody for listening. I love it's always this, sunny, man. This episode of. Uh, the Watchtower podcast. Uh, I mean, I think we all agree that all the films that we talked about today are fantastic films. That, yes, that are them, appreciated and and need to be watched and, and need to be watched in theaters. Like Yokomoto said, if you're able to see any of these films in theaters uh, on a re-release, do it. Yeah, man. and like I was saying too, like if you disagree or you guys caught something we didn't catch, yeah, please let us comments, know. Man. Please let us know. I think I know have, everything, but we I don't have don't. any time, unfortunately, to talk about the Cable Guy. Uh, today, but um, you know, next episode, we'll, we'll maybe we'll have some time. You uh, said we're gonna sneak in ten minutes or something. <laughs> ten minutes. <laughs> ten minutes. Uh, uh, that's already past time. Damn. Next time, though, right? Next time, right? Next, next time. Yeah, yeah, next sure. Time. Right. We'll okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, next yeah. episode. <laughs> all right. Now, I want to thank all, all the people for being on. Uh, you guys are awesome on the show. Uh, John Eric Castro, Christian Yokomoto Medina, Michael De La O, and Austin Young. Thank you guys for being on and and giving me your thoughts on this film because. Um, I'm so glad I revisited Interstellar, man. It it, it just reminded me of what I felt yes. when I first saw it. So, Interstellar, go check it out. And we'll see you guys on the next episode of the Watchtower Ooh. Podcast.